the first bit. Penny, do you have anything to uh, anything to add to get us going this morning? I just need everyone to please note that the first case uh, has been, which was Pennington Bend, that's been set for our next meeting. All right, thank you. All right, so we'll move on to case number 2017-0015. It's the Staybridge Hotel. Uh, if the applicants would please come to the table. Do we have that written out? Okay, I want to read the opening statement. If you are not satisfied with a decision made by the Stormwater Management Committee, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of centuria with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision. You are advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. All right, thank you, Penny. Uh, Mr. Galbraith did call to my attention that the meeting minutes and decision letters are up at the top of the agenda. So we'll take a quick minute and go ahead and vote on decision letters in minutes. Has everybody had a chance to review those? Do we have a motion to approve those? A motion to approve them as amended in the staff report. Thank you. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. So, well, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. <clears throat> I said, I'm in. I couldn't get my microphone turned on. So. <laughs> Thank you. All right, motion carries for the approval of the meeting minutes and letters. I'm abstaining. Thank you. Catch that. Oh, yeah, there. Yeah, that's right. All right, now we'll move on to case number 2017-0015. It's the Staybridge Hotel. At this time, I'll turn it over to the applicant. <laughs> Oh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Kevin Gangaware. I'm with Civil Site Design Group, I'm representing the um, applicant in this uh, case. This is a preliminary, um, and so uh, I've explained to my client uh, that basically we're going to explain what we're proposing, why we're proposing it, and then get your feedback, your thoughts on. Uh, uh, whether we could move forward with the final uh, and the expectations. Uh, I also told him, uh, listen, we're going to sit around a conference room table and we're going to look at the plans. And I didn't realize you got to this fancy smancy place here. So, um, so I'm not sure how we'll be able to. Kevin, it's under your paper there. Oh, you, you got it. There you go. Oh, wait, what's, it's black. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for red. Um, so this project is a 120-room hotel uh, and some mixed-use um, uh, retail commercial space. 
uh, on a very narrow, very steep piece of property in the Century City um, uh, development. Um, it's next to an existing ornamental pond or lake uh, that was built in the early 80s um, along the Sims Branch Creek. And <clears throat> this existing lake has a uh, walking trail and is, um, is mowed and nicely manicured all around the lake. Uh, and so we're into the edge of the buffer uh, with our proposal. Um, most of the buffer uh, that we're encroaching into is along the existing lake. And so a lot of what we're displacing with uh, in the buffer is existing mowed grass. Um, certainly some, some very nice large trees, but, uh, but it is a manicured area. It's not necessarily just all wooded. Um, now, as you go uh, to, the, to the northwest down Sims Branch downstream, uh, once you get past the lake, then it is certainly wooded again, although uh, we're in the, the zone two buffer uh, with our improvements there and, and not in the zone one portion there. So, so uh, we have, uh, or the architect rather, has worked many, many different site plans to try to uh, come up with a, a plan that uh, does not get in the buffer. Um, some of the complications for our project are uh, that the Staybridge Hotel or any hotel, um, they have to review and approve some schematic plans to begin with uh, uh, in order to even give our client uh, the opportunity to, to build their uh, flagship hotel in this location. So they've had to go through that process and they've had to give them some site plans uh, to go with. They have certain criteria that the architect will explain to you in a minute um, that we have to stay with um, on the property. So those are the hardships. The hardships that create our issue are uh, a very narrow lot, very steep slopes. Uh, we're already into uh, retaining walls that'll be in excess of a million dollars in order to get this pr property. So not that that has anything to do with the buffer, but just to let you know that the steep slopes um, are part of our issue and the narrowness of the lot. <clears throat> and um, so we are here to, we understand that we've got both uh, disturbance in both the zone one and zone two. Uh, we're here to um, get your ideas and thoughts and opinions on what we are proposing, um, what you're um, willing to accept, what you're not willing to accept, if anything, uh, what we, what your opinions are if for an improvement to the plan, if anything. Um, that's what we hope to, to get out of this meeting uh, today. If we can walk out of here with a with your ideas of a way that we can um, create a plan that come back with and get a final approval, we will consider ourselves uh, lucky and very successful meeting. So with that, let me uh, turn it over to the architect to talk about um, some of the constraints related to the building and the site. I'm Mark Tiedemann, hotel and resort architect. I'm out of New York. I just flew in for this meeting. Um, briefly wanted to discuss the hotel. It's a Staybridge, 122 units. And uh, basically, you know, we, we do these hotel projects in all over the country, in California, in New York, Tennessee, obviously here, down to Florida. Um, and there are certain requirements for a franchise hotel to be successful. And in this particular hotel, um, one is a court. It's like a half of a basketball court, you know. <coughs> Never really played basketball too much, but uh, I do see kids, they play half court. So, so one of the requirements for this particular extended state property is a half a basketball court. In addition, it's a pool. You know, an amenity is a pool to draw uh, extended stay um, clients or customers to the property. You have to have some sort of pool and outdoor area. So these amenities, uh, the type of franchise this is, an extended stay, is to have it more home-like, but also to have these um, uh, exterior features that uh, flow with the property so that as a guest arrives and goes through the building and has their extended stay apartment there, that they can flow out to what I'll call the backyard space. You know, and we cut down the building tremendously on this uh, because the building actually is U-shape. And you'll see right now it's more like a C-shape. So architecturally, we were able to create a very pleasant facade 
uh, in keeping with the exterior design requirements of the franchise, but also giving it a nice residential feel so it's consistent with the upland area where there's an apartment development on the other side, which is residential. So this is a very nice transitional development. Unfortunately, we have a very long and narrow site, uh, so we, we tried to reduce um, the pavement access on the exterior, but also we wanted to make sure that, you know, because this does have a bike path surrounding the lake there, that we would provide public access to the lake uh, from the hotel. Uh, and also from the small, I'll call it neighborhood retail development that's next to it, that it would be conducive to have that development with the existing neighborhood, which is mostly large commercial office buildings that maybe uh, small like a coffee shop or take in, take out type of dining experience that would, that would work really well with the rest of the neighborhood and the apartments too. So we looked at the property as sort of a transitional property where you could come down the street, walk into this area, have a coffee shop, and enjoy the beauty of the, the lake there. And the, you know, fortunately, you know, my client here, you know, I first went out there probably back the last October, I think September, October, there's a beautiful fountain there, and there's people walking, if you've ever been out there walking, just around this little path around the lake. So we wanted to basically bring that synergy back to the property. So in doing all of this, of course, we've, we, we've reduced and reduced, and I think we're about 8% in the buffer zone. And I think just this past April, <clears throat> we, we lost a couple more feet because of the, uh, the line got readjusted. So, but ultimately, I believe we've created a uh, very uh, conducive uh, neighbor uh, type of building here that's gonna fit very nicely into the zoning and the neighborhood um, in consideration uh, of the property and constraints that we have with the property. Uh, one other thing I wanna just you know, talk about is that, uh, yeah, it is totally mowed out there. But also, you know, I was sitting on the airplane flying here last night, and I just went on the interactive uh, website here uh, that you have for the topography. And one of the interesting things about the site is that I thought it actually was more of a floodway, but it's really not. It's really this habitat uh, creating and, and don't disturb type of area, which is great. Uh, but in this particular instance, it's disturbed, and on top of that, the topography for the floodway, it's really, the elevations really rise up because we have, um, almost a cliff behind us for this building, so it tucks in there very nicely. Uh, but architecturally, you know, I think it flows very well, and I think it's consistent with, um, you know, what you guys are trying to achieve here, and the least amount of disturbance, if any disturbance. So, thank you. All right, thank you, guys. Um, is anybody from the audience or the community want to speak for or against the project? Seeing none, we'll, we'll move on. Um, I, I guess at this time we'll open up to the committee for uh, comments and review. Um, what's been our normal stance on uh, BMPs within the buffers? Um, Do we have consistency on that? Or? Uh, maybe not consistency, but we tend to keep them out of zone one, mm -hmm. uh, somewhat allow them in zone two. Uh, prefer them not to be in the buffers at all uh, for, the, for the regs, but try to preserve that zone one at all cost. I mean, that's one of the things I noticed. I mean, some of these BMPs are in the zone one. Uh, I mean, I, I guess my initial thoughts would be that um, there, there looks like there's some flexibility here, but to try to stay outside of the zone one. That's probably a consensus that we would normally, I, I think, would. probably, that's the first thing I would notice. Um, I know there's a, I'm very familiar with Century City. I actually designed, I did the original layouts in Century City back in the 1970s. <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, um, um, and there's some unusual parcels down there. And, and this is one of the ones that's very steep and challenging. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when this development is completed, I assume they're going to try to keep or maintain a, a nature trail around the existing lake. Yes. And so it's going to get very narrow. And so that's just one of the things that I noticed. But uh, initially, I'd say, you know, I would encourage the applicant to try to stay out of the zone one buffer. Could All we bring together, up Roy, or just, just the BMP part? Well, I, 
I mean, a lot of the zone one disturbance, mm -hmm. other than the BMP that you're speaking of, is uh, slopes retain, you know, changing the grades basically, yeah. you know, slopes and retaining walls. So, uh, kind of adjusting the grades in the zone one. Would that be okay? Um. They're just, I guess what I'm throwing out are just an initial thoughts based upon the history of this committee. Uh, and um, I'm probably one of the easier ones to work with when, it, when, it deal, when you're dealing with uh, encroachments within the buffer, but I'm just trying to provide you with a little bit of uh, advice of what I think you would run across. Yes, sir. And so I think that pretty much any encroachment or any grading into the zone one buffer is probably going to be a little bit of an issue. Uh, I know you've got some retaining walls. I like on the upper side of the site, along the, uh, I guess this is, I don't know if it's oriented towards the north, but towards the top of the page, there's a retaining wall. What's the height of that wall? Uh, are you looking where the parking lot is? Yeah, the, exactly. I mean, um, it's uh, probably about eight feet. Uh huh. So, um, and I know you do have some fairly wide grass medians. I mean, there, there seems to be, there may be a little bit of flexibility to try to push things away a little bit. Gotcha. But that's just an initial um, thing that I noted. I'd like to hear from everybody else. Yeah, I'll go next. Um, I mean, Kevin, you sat on this committee, so you kind of know where I come from, but I'm going to have a hard time justifying the density. I mean, I understand that the, uh, the owner didn't, wasn't given a proper survey when they bought the property or got an option on it, whatever it was, but um, those buffers should have been on their survey and uh, the expectations may be a little high for this owner. And um, I'm gonna have a hard time just finding anything other than just the hotel or the retail alone. I mean, I just, I just am. Um, the, uh, the property with the buffers, which were certainly there, just doesn't, you know, can't handle that much, uh, unfortunately. So, I, 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 you know, I, typically I, I will review and and and, um, and and consider certainly encroachment into zone twos um, under conditions like this for certain parking stuff like that. But the zone one encroachments here, I just can't see myself justifying. Thank you. Yeah. Could we bring up an aerial photograph of the area? So Roy, when this was designed, is there any water, or what's the water quality aspects of that lake? What what kind of water quality features does that lake provide? I, I did the master planning. I didn't get involved as much in the individual design. Gotcha. And, and so I don't even recall. I think that was mainly meant to be just a water feature. I mean, we back in the late 70s and early 90s, we didn't really get into water quality that much. It was all detention. That's really what all that was. Okay. And so uh, there may be a, a detention feature here, but. Uh, so, but, but this area is utilized. It's, it's walkable and it's uh, the, all the people that live in this or that work here, they enjoy that area as well. Mm -hmm. And so uh, maintaining a wide buffer, I think, adjacent to that's probably a pretty good idea. And we're not disturbing the existing trail that's there. Right. It's, it's not on our property and we're not disturbing it. I guess... Um, <clears throat> I'm not big on getting into the zone one buffer either, but uh, I do see some leniency from my opinion on this because that's already disturbed. That zone one around that lake uh, is currently mowed, maintained, disturbed for that, that trail and pathway. Um, uh, now there is grass out there, there is some water quality benefits from that, and I would just challenge you to really show us in the mitigation plan how you're compensating, how, how you're providing that, that mitigation, or providing that, that water uh, cleaning ability that we're losing by what little buffer we're losing. That makes sense? Makes sense to me. It's sort of always been my stance. I mean, 
Um, but our, my comments are really based upon the history of this body and, and what we've normally done. Uh, and so I'm just trying to provide the applicant that knowledge that generally we discourage encroachments into that zone one buffer, generally. And so if there's a way that they can revise their plan and, and minimize that and still maintain water quality in some other method, then that's something I think that they would have possibly have some success with, in my opinion. I definitely echo that. Any way we can lessen the encroachment in zone one, the better. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw that in there. Um, so I might just leave it at that. Well, um, I'm just yes, sir. I'm Grover Collins with the Collins Law Firm representing them. Just so I'm clear on the question or the recommendation, as long as we do everything we can to maintain the water quality, you're not saying out and out that you wouldn't approve a zone one encroachment, is that correct? You're gonna find many uh, different opinions on that. <laughs> so, so you know, to me, this is a water quality board, in my opinion, that's, that's just my opinion. And so the buffers are, are sort of established to provide water quality. If you could provide water quality in some other method, then I'm probably one that would be more lenient on a buffer encroachment, but there would be others that would not. That's why this is a varying committee with, you know, with, uh, you know uh, varying knowledges and opinions. And, and so, um, you know, Dr. I'm sure it can probably should chime him in, and, and, and he'll help probably help you a little bit from a, you know from a slightly different perspective. And then there are also members on this board that are more neighborhood oriented as well, and and, and which may be uh, have more opinions about uses and and, and things like that. So, um, thank you. Good Any other comments from the committee? God, no. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes, Michael. Just one note of clarification because I didn't see it on the notes. Sims Branch is considered habitat for the Nashville crayfish just as mm. we move forward. Thank you. But that, you know, I, I, don't, I know that this uh, Sims Branch, uh, this is a, this, this finger goes up to the airport, right? And I know there was, we've always had discussions about the de-icing and all that. So, you know, what, is, what has been the effect of that on this, on this section of the tributary? I do know that in, in us working with the airport, they have undertaken several measures to try to accommodate the de-icing. I think the last couple of years, the opportunity for them to de-ice has not been as great as maybe in some past years, but I do know they have a biological treatment facility on site, and then they also have the wherewithal to divert that de-icing fluid as needed during extremely icy conditions. Okay. Um, you know, this is my former, my former council district too, so I guess I'm very well vetted in this area, but uh, this parcel has been sitting here a while. I would like to see something happen on it. Um, I, I, I think that uh, there's some opportunities here, and I think it's a, uh, it is a challenging piece of property. There's no doubt about it. I've done several layouts myself on it over the years. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, you can come back with something that uh, will work. Could I, could I ask the committee one question? Yes, sir. Um, a, a piece of information just wanted to share with you and get your thoughts on it. Uh, there's a, several acres of the apartment complex that's up on top of the hill uh, that drains across this property to yep. the stream. If, uh, if this development could, instead of just passing that water through, collect it, treat it, um, would that... I, certainly that's a benefit uh, without a doubt, but w would that help um, us or I guess you guys to allow us to do some more of the disturbance in zone one if we're kind of treating much more than just our property, but now we're treating some untreated parking lots and roofs coming to, to the area? I think you'll get varying opinions on that. Sure. Uh, uh, philosophically, uh, more you know, have more of the hardscapes in the zone one probably concern me a little bit. If if, if it blends in naturally, maybe that would sway me. But retaining walls or, or things like that probably, I uh, probably would have a concern with. Okay, thank you. You guys want to take a minute to look at the mitigation plan that's proposed or the mitigation plan in front of us? 
I'm sorry? The mitigation plan that you proposed. I just kind of point out the highlights of, of what you're thinking about sure. for mitigation right now. Yeah, and I mean, um, Lance, that, uh, again, I think our idea was how far out in, in left field are we with this plan uh, yep. is kind of really what we were hoping to gauge and understand here. So the mitigation here is, you know, we could load up that area with landscaping um, if that is a positive. Um, my thoughts about mitigation and some of the committee members, uh, I guess, vary or different. Um, so uh, right now, this plan is basically let's do a, a bunch of canopy trees and landscaping in the edge. Um, you know, uh, th that's our mitigation. So uh, I think the idea of treating some offsite water is a more constructive mitigation idea um, that we ought to consider and think about and see if we can find some space for that. Okay. Um, So yeah, I wouldn't put. It's not a bad much, idea. Right, right. I wouldn't put too much uh, <laughs> reliance on our mitigation plan. It was, um, it, it was, it was an attempt to uh, to show that we're interested in mitigating, but uh, don't have a lot of really good options other than this offsite portion. Gotcha. You know, for instance, Kevin, on this uh, <coughs> behind the hotel building where you have a detention water quality and it says retaining wall, yes, sir. and it's sort of next to that trail, do you yeah. have any idea what the height of that wall would be? Yeah, I can look, I can tell you real quick. <coughs> So it's probably about uh, 10 feet yeah. there, 10. And that's, so that's sort of my point. I mean, you, you, this really pinches down. That nature trail is getting fairly close to the floodway. And then with the 10-foot wall there, to me, that's just a, a large physical imposing encroachment right. Right. Uh, that if it could be softened up, it would probably make me feel better. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, I think we could actually probably run some landscaping, maybe step it back. I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm just say right now it's just two yeah, instead it's, of a wall. There's a visual yeah. buffer or a barrier there that to me sort of takes away from what the concept of a buffer would be. Right, right. I feel like I'm taking up too much. Uh, <laughs> someone else probably needs to chime in. So I, I got you. Um, Overall, I would like to see something go in here. Uh, years ago, I worked in this area, and I, I have walked this trail, and so it's kind of been crafted and created for something, so I, I want to provide some leniency because I would like to see it developed into something. Uh, this is a, um, a good use for it. It does seem a little ambitious, uh, especially with the retail on the side. To me, it does seem a little ambitious to cram all this in. Um, but I would I would be open to zone two buffer disturbances and just mitigate as much as possible that zone one buffer disturbance. And I think with the terrace there on the, on the back side of the uh, retail, because we were thinking, again, more neighborhood type of community um, in and out coffee type of thing, and um, nothing like a drive through, but more like a caribou coffee where people come and sit down type of thing. Uh, but the terrace we were looking at um, a uh, porous paver so the water would flow through it. So. I don't see any staff comments on this. Does, does staff have, have any comments that I'm, I'm missing? I think I noticed that they met with Paula, right? Does that, did I read that, that you so, have met with staff? We did, we had yeah. a, a our, pre- our, <coughs> Excuse me. Our typical City comments level. are that we don't, we usually don't support any <coughs> zone one buffer disturbance. Mm -hmm. um, and as for clarification, uh, we allow grading in the zone two, but no stormwater management features, the BMPs right. on staff level. So, um, no grading in the zone one. You were allowing grading in the zone one, uh, zone two, but no, no water quality features. That's usually uh, the stance. That's that's the way the regs are written. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dodd. Nah. Go ahead. Chime in. Well, when you come for preliminary input, you deserve input, so um, I, I need to give this a lot more thought uh, myself, but 
My, my primary concern, and, I, and I'm not sure one, I'm not sure it's one that can be overcome by the stormwater regulations. It's just a professional observation. Is that um, we're, we're going to be losing lots of spongy cover on the site. Uh, so I do think Mr. Gangerware is thinking appropriately, although I don't know if there's anything that we can do legally to require him to, to proceed with treating off-site drainage and not just letting it pass through. I think that's very wise and very appropriate and, and a very civically minded perspective. Um, but I, like Mr. Slate, I am concerned about the density of the site. Uh, there's really nothing you can do to replicate the water absorption and by virtue of that water absorption, the water quality treatment of that existing undeveloped landscape, uh, at least the portions that are covered in trees. Uh, the mowed areas don't provide a lot of benefit. Uh, uh, so to water quality. So from that perspective, uh, uh, I, I wish the site could be, the development could be shrunk significantly, but I realize you've got an economic model that you're trying to achieve. Um, I very much appreciate the company sending someone down here from New York to speak to us, to take the time, to give us the proper insight. And, um, I'm not sure there's much else I can say without seeing what comes next. So, Thank you. I, 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 I will say that, unfortunately, um, we're normally able to give you a little more confident, um, a, a little more confident position preliminarily about a project, and this one has got lots of complexity. So, I'd, you know, if I were you, I would expect to come back here and, as, as Mr. Dale appropriately said, to hear a lot of varied opinion. And, uh, and unfortunately, that puts your time and your investment of additional capital and effort in this a little more at risk because you're not guaranteed an outcome and, 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 and it doesn't sound like you have a strong preliminary direction that the entire board is giving you. And that's typically, it's the entire board that, <coughs> that has to uh, formalize the decision. So, uh, so uh, but I think you have got enough guidance to give it your best shot, so. Thank you. Thanks. All right, guys, thank you. Thanks. Um, I even forget, we don't really vote on preliminary plans. Um, we just provide that input to it, but I think voice of our Deborah, you have one more comment? Yeah, I was just going to echo the staying out of the zone one buffer. I think if, you know, you've heard that echoed from many members of the board now, so if, if you know, we said there's multiple opinions, but maybe that's one opinion we have consensus on, um, and that might help, so. Thank you. And every time we mention that, I can hear other board members sort of saying, uh-huh. So you, you, you probably can't hear that, but I can hear it. So just want you to know that that is the main thing you're going to uh, face. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Very good. Thank All you right, very thank much. You. Thank you, guys. You have a great Appreciate day. Appreciate it. We'll move this along to the next case, the 2017-0016, a loft hotel. If the applicant would come to the table. Hey, Lance. Yes. Um, oh, no. 
do have the staff give comments since we don't have the comments perhaps we can give yep. us some comments and the guidance on what they thought process for us earlier on earlier on yeah. agreed thank you agreed. yeah i was uh, a little transitional not quite as as, as it was before. Used to it. Got thrown off by i think yes yes sir. we just expect it. We'll call, we'll call for it. I think it's a good, good idea. <laughs> good morning. Uh, I am here to um, talk to you guys and see if I can convince you that our project is uh, a responsible project and we are trying to do everything we can to comply uh, with the codes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would like uh, my civil engineer to start. Can you hold on just a second? Sure. Yeah. We're going to read the case uh, introduction into the record first. And so hold your thoughts. I hate to stop you, but hold your thoughts for a second, and we'll introduce the case so it's officially done in. Thank you. Sure. This is case number 2017-00016 Olaf Hotel. It's 608 and 610 McGavick Pike, APN numbers 09511019000 and 09511017900. The applicant's request. The request is to allow the following. Disturbance and encroachment to fill eliminate 0 0.179, 0 0.209 AC total, 0 0.032 AC left on site of wetland and in encompassation of 198 linear feet of stream permitted by TDEC permit number NRS 16.124, they allowed off-site mitigation credits of 0 0.49 AC purchased from Swamp Road Mitig Mitigation Bank 2 at a 2.2 ratio. NPNDES permit number TR, excuse me, TNR 2406.79 and USACE permit for driveway crossing permit under Metro Section 6.9.2, Table 6-3, and construction of hotel. Footprints occupy 11% of total land and parking. The total associated 25 feet buffers for wetland and 30 feet buffers for streams to be eliminated, 0 0.226. Note, 168 linear feet includes reinstallation of exist, existing 60-inch linear feet, 15-inch RCP pipe under permitted by Metro, however was permitted by TNEC permit number NRS 13.227 and NRS 13.227A. Two. Disturbance and encroachment of 0 0.033 of 50-inch stream buffer zone 2 of the unnamed tributary to Sims Branch for construction of driveway crossing permitted under Metro Section 6.9.5 Table 6-3 and parking. Alteration to, committee, to community waters. Three multiple crossings less than 1,000 feet apart. Number five, placement of stormwater BMP in the buffer. Six, waiver of buffer around newly constructed wetland, 0 0.03 acres to allow placement of parking. Number seven, approval of past disturbance and encroachment. 
60-inch wire crossing and 0 0.032, including an item one, wetland disturbance permitted by TDEC permit number NRS 13.227 and 227A. Number A, allow proposed driveway aisles to be counted as driveway crossings, and number nine, continuous mowing and maintenance of the buffer. The appellant for 608 Hotels, LLC, and Centura Children 2016 Trust. Representative is Mr. Tareen Centuria. The comments are as follows. Stormwater staff. Staff comments are stated as those from previous meeting on May 5th, 2017, which gives the site history of uh, 080622 NOV for grading without a permit, stream, and stream buffer disturbance. In 08, 21 of 02, NOV for inadequate EPSC resulting in segment discharge. 0823 of 02, TDEC issues NOV for damaging grading and filling of this unnamed tributary to Sims Branch. 1120 of 03, variant request to re relocate and culvert stream was denied. Applicant instructed to re restore disturbance buffer. 09 of 2014, MWS discovered a pipe installed without a grading permit and contacted TDEC. The work was approved under TDEC permit number NRS 13.227, but was not compliance with the condition. MWS opt for TDC to purchase, excuse me, to pursue enforcement given their permit issue for the activity. Number two, the site plan for record involves significant stream buffer and aquatic resource disturbance that will have ongoing impacts to future stormwater and ground groundwater discharge from the site with limited mitigation being proposed, as such staff cannot support the plan as submitted. Number three, this site is within the Mill Creek watershed habitat of the endangered Mill Creek crayfish and specifically involves Sim Branch, which is on the 2014 TDEC 303 Section D list as being impacted by total low dis, dis, excuse me, dissolved oxygen habitat and E. coli. Codes, no comment provided. Planning, they deferred. Site is zoned CL, deferred to stormwater for review. Greenway deferred to stormwater staff comments. All right, thank you, Penny. Now this time we'll turn it over to the applicant. Uh, so Mr. Please. Chairman. Yes, sir. Got a point of order. How similar or dissimilar is this proposal to the one that we've already heard? That's a good question. I'll point I'll go to the applicant real quick. Uh, we heard this last month. Uh, what has changed since That's then? Significantly different. I'll, I'll address that in the first three or four minutes of my uh, opening statement. Okay. I'd, I'd like to hear from our council as to why we're rehearing something that I thought we voted down. I thought we voted down, yeah. Good point. Um, so. For rehearings, the provisions of the um, uh, 
standing rules of procedure of the committee um, says no rehearing of the decision of the committee shall be had except one on motion to reconsider that vote by a member of the majority of the committee on the preceding vote or two on a written request by the appellant for a hearing. If the motion or written request to reconsider receives three affirmative votes, the committee shall hold a rehearing subject to such conditions as the committee may by resolution in each case stipulate. New request other than by a committee member to grant a rehearing will be entertained, I think it should say will not be entertained, unless new evidence is submitted which could not reasonably be presented at the previous hearing. If the request for a rehearing is granted, the case shall be put on the calendar for rehearing. In all cases, the request for a rehearing shall be in writing, reciting the reasons for the request, and shall be duly verified and accompanied by the necessary data and diagrams. The person requesting the rehearing shall be notified to appear before the committee on a date to be set by the committee. Such notification shall be by the secretary. So, um, so are they back to request a rehearing? I'm not sure that they are. Um, I think that was maybe what Mr. Galworth was getting at, mm -hmm. but um, if the plan is substantially different than the previously submitted one, um, would that be considered a, a new re new request, basically? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I think the, the difference is that I don't think this came back as a rehearing, but a new hearing because, as the applicant states, they feel it's substantially different. So it's more of a new hearing versus a rehearing. But is this, did they start the process over again, or is this a continuation of the same application? I mean, did they pay fees? Did they start, did they start from scratch? Well, they, uh, I don't recall if they paid fees. Mm -hmm. I assume they did, but we did have new pre-application meetings. Yeah, I mean, I think to me that's pre, that would, in my mind, constitute whether this is a, a rehearing or, or a new application. So th that's a pretty critical question from my perspective. Is did the, the day? Number. Pardon? Different number. Okay. Case case numbers are different. All right. Okay. okay. So this is a. I brand mean, new I think staff staff has probably brought this to us as a new case. Is we, that correct? We did. Okay. okay. Thanks for the clarification. So it's a brand new application, brand new case. And and I, I just want to make this point that. Um, We've seen other applicants follow a due process that is laid out in our administrative procedure, and and they and they've gone through a very a very dutiful effort to follow that process. Um, I, I'm not sure this is following that process, and um, I, I'm not trying to bring this up to be difficult for the applicant or for those who've taken out time today to be here. It's very important that we treat everybody the same. And we've had some cases recently where people followed the process. Um, so I, I just don't know why this is presented here this way because I, I don't think it's consistent with the process. Uh, I, I don't mind entertaining a motion to rehear it. I, I, I think it ought to be properly public noticed. Uh, and I also think that if we proceed the way we are now, we're setting up a situation where we're not following the process that we've asked others to, to follow recently. That's sort of my question. If they started from, if they started all over, they sat down, they had a pre-construction conference, they paid their fees, they have a different case number, and if the staff has reviewed this as a separate application, then it would not be considered a rehearing. And, and we did just exactly as you mentioned. Okay. Um, there, there is a question that you guys are bringing up: is is there a substantial change to the plan? Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a little bit gray on our side. The applicant definitely thinks that there is a substantial change, and that's why they brought it back. Um, we share the same sentiments. We were a little hesitant, but we. We, we went through the same process as if it was a brand new And process. I think we would ultimately have to leave that decision to you. We're not here to make that choice. So if an applicant comes back with a plan that you feel like is substantially different and, and you process it that way, then I think we're, it's inherent upon us to accept your decision and, and review it accordingly. So uh, technically it's close to a rehearing, but I think based upon staff, they're saying that this has changed enough that they would consider this to be a new application. That's my understanding. If I'm wrong, just correct me. Then, then for the record, I want to hear staff say that it's this is significantly different, that it's not a gray area, but that it's significantly different. 
Well, so the biggest things that came uh, from your initial uh, meeting was that they uh, they went back and they, they deleted some entrances. So they they eliminated at least one um, they eliminated at least one crossing out of out of the plan. <coughs> and then the other substantial change that they feel is uh, brought up is that they understood that they took they took it that you you feel that they did not do enough on site mitigation. So they revised the plan to do more on site mitigation. So that's the two key changes that they brought back is. Uh, less crossings, which was a less buffer disturbance, and more on-site mitigation. Mr. Chairman, uh, this does not sound like our process. I, with all due respect to staff, uh, I think it's staff's obligation to try to serve the public efficiently and judiciously. I do not think we're following procedure today. I, I, I think something is amiss in the interpretation of a substantial change in this presentation. Legal counsel, can you all weigh in on that? Sure. I mean, um, I don't think that the rehearing rules in the internal operating regulations and rules of this committee um, prohibit the same applicant from coming back before you with a new hearing on the same property as long as a new plan is being submitted. I think that can be a new hearing and a new application. I mean, I, I would defer to engineering staff in terms of whether the new plan really is substantially different from the old plan. but. It, you know, just from a honoring the rules perspective, I think that that can be done as long as it is a different plan. So it sounds like this has a new application number. It is a new plan before us, uh, so we need to view it as a new plan. It's not a rehearing. It's not bringing it back up. I, I share Mr. Galbraith's uh, concern. It just does feel a little bit out of order. So maybe we don't talk about um, what's changed since the last plan. Let's just focus on this as a new plan. Um, it's convoluted, and there's no doubt about it's it. It's very convoluted. But, but, and I think that we have the history of what we did before, and I, I think we have to think about that. But I think we consider it as a new plan, uh, just like other projects that come back before us on the same piece of property. We do have some knowledge about what occurred before. And looking at this plan, it's probably, not, it's probably going to wind up the same result. It's just going to take a little time, um, and that's unfortunate. But uh, I think that we have to process this based upon the fact that they've made application. It has been advertised. They've paid their fee this as a plan. And, and I would say that I think as far as notice is concerned that the, the way it was listed on the agenda and the normal amount of notice that is given when the agenda is publicly published is adequate from an open meetings compliance perspective. Okay. So if we could just gear it not towards what happened then, what, what's now, it is a new plan. Okay. And so view it with fresh eyes and fresh comments. I think in a lot of council's comments, that's all we can do. I, I, I do think this is something from the applicant's perspective and for the public's expectation about fairness and due process that we need to revisit our administrative procedures. I mean, Mr. Galbraith, I agree with you that it's um, probably a fine line yeah. um, in terms of um, you know, whether there really is a, a substantial difference from the plan previously reviewed, and, and if there was not, then I think it would fall within the rehearing provisions of the rules. Um, but, um, I, I mean, it does sound like there are some fairly significant differences. So, I mean, I think I probably would encourage you to err on the side of giving them the benefit of the doubt. And we share your concerns too, Mr. Galbraith. <coughs> and just like Ms. Casona said, we did err on the side of not denying them the right to come back. But we agree it's, it's, it was a very fine line, and uh, we, we erred in the side of at least bringing it back to you guys. Yeah, that, I, and I'm just thinking of the previous applicant who was here what, two, three months ago that struggled through multiple hearings, followed the process the way we laid it out, and this doesn't seem the same process that that applicant had to follow. That's that's all I'm concerned about. I think, I think the difference is that person, that person continued the same appeal number. 
and if, and if a tax owner wants to continue to appeal the same question, I believe constitutionally probably they're allowed to continue to ask the same question. I have no problem As long that. as they start over. And I think that's what happened. They started over. So I they can continue to bring this to us. And even though it's a waste of our time, we can hear it every month. For, I, I mean, I'm not sure I would do that. I mean, if it was exactly the same plan, I would say that it should fall within the rehearing sure. um, provisions. But, um, uh, but I mean, um, I, like I said, the same applicant and the same property isn't prohibited in coming back before you with a new application as long as it really is a new application. And I, and, and I, and I think the issue of time is why we need to revisit the administrative procedures, but that's a matter for another day, and I apologize to the gentleman. This committee certainly does have debate, the ability so. to amend its, its, proceed, its rules and regulations. Um, there's a process for that and notice for that, but you can do that if, if you Well, let's make note of that to come back to in a business board of the meeting uh, at a future time and go ahead and move forward with the case. All right. Thank you, guys. I appreciate your uh, patience on this, and I'll turn it over to the applicant. Thank you. So as you know, uh, Mr. Theron Surdy is the applicant. Uh, I'm Chet Rhodes with Rhodes Engineering and Consultants. Been working with Mr. Surdy uh, on this particular project, uh, trying to develop this, and it's been changing. Uh, first of all, I, I do want to say I see significant changes from this plan and the one presented last month just in the, what the staff said. And I don't think there's any part of the process that we didn't follow. Follow key, make sure that when you submit for this committee, you know, you have to go through the right steps. So I don't think he skipped any steps. And I hope you all are, can clear your mind of the previous debate and give us a fair hearing because I heard several negative comments toward the plan already before we've begun, which causes me concern. So. I just want to say that for the record that, you know, everybody ready to go and we're, we are clear and what I'm here to do is just real briefly in three to four minutes give you history that you didn't hear prior uh, and then the new plan is coming from the other consultants. But I wanted to take you back to the history of this particular hotel project. Uh, there were many layouts made. This thing started in January of 2016 when I first began working with Mr. Surdy. Uh, the first thing we did was went to Metro, and first fellow we dealt with was Steve Michu. Uh, back in uh, uh, February the 3rd of 16, Michu gave us some good advice on how to start this project because there was a stream and there were buffers and there were wetlands, all of which he mentioned in the email to us. And he helped us with, uh, if you remember, uh, Clive was there as well. They did a study to see what how big the basin was. There was a big question about if there's more than a square mile of a stream above a particular area, it needs to be studied. And they helped us determine that there was less than a square mile actually coming to that area. Therefore, the study wasn't, no stream study was required. But the 50-foot buffer from the top of the bank and the wetland buffers identified by TDEC are specific guidance that Mr. Michu initially gave us. That was the first contact we had on this project. Uh, with Metro, and we did follow their advice. We got with TDEC. The other thing that I quickly saw as I began working with Mr. Surdy is a big TVA easement, uh, 150 foot through the side of the property, and we immediately began working with TVA as well to uh, secure their approvals on what we were doing and our plans. Through the course of that many layouts, the footprint got smaller and smaller and smaller, less and less impact to address the various and several comments that we received. So then we began to deal with Megan Plock in the spring of uh, 2016. She's with TDEC Water Resources. And as far as the the quality of the wetland there, uh, Mr. Surdy hired Rambo Environ, a consulting firm in Brentwood, Tennessee, to do a wetland delineation and a water quality study and a characteristic study of the wetlands, what type of wetlands, what value and resource, and this was at the direction of TDEC. You know, we're basically following what they told us to do, and uh, a copy of that report is available to, to you all to, to look at, but that was necessary to pursue the TDEC permit on the, uh, the wetland mitigation. Uh, basically, from that point, we did receive TDEC, TVA approval for be able to, to do some grading in their easement in the summer of 16. And the fall of 16 was a public hearing regarding our mitigation plan to deal with the wetland and the stream on site. 
Uh, Want to tell you the findings of the initial Rambo report uh, was that there was a high quality wetland at the west end of that particular wetland that comes out of the little hillside there to the west. And there was some other lower quality wetlands between there and the stream. And so we focused on what TDEC was telling us to do, and that was provide an on-site mitigation plan to deal with the, the wetland loss, which was small amount, uh, but uh, 0.209 acres of wetlands being impacted. And, uh, but still, you know, it was a quality wetland or what they ended up determining, and TDEC agreed that it was a moderate value resource, which was worth, in their opinion, saving with the mitigation plan. So uh, that's what we pursued. We submitted the mitigation plan. Uh, after many revisions to that, we were on the verge of getting it approved. TDEC came back to Mr. Surdy and I and said, look, you've done everything we've asked you to do, but we don't think you should mitigate this on site. After all that work and effort, I was like, what? And they said, no, we really think for long-term maintenance of the wetland quality in Davidson County that we, we would like to see you to go to a bank, purchase greater than two to one offset, whatever's lost, replace it with at least two to one wetland elsewhere in the, near the site. So we did that. We then came back with a mitigation plan that involved completely off-site wetland, none on-site, per the direction of TDEC. And that's what we went out to a public hearing with in October of 2016. Uh, at that meeting, well, we did have an open meeting request, uh, you know, the 30-day process, the uh, Mill Creek Watershed Association called for a meeting in that hearing time. Uh, Mr. Surdy and I went and met with them, listened to their concerns, and we explained to them the several things that we'd done to that point to address the wetland issues on site. And I thought we had a very productive meeting with them. I see a couple of folks from that meeting here today. And, you know, we, I think, tried to work with that. One thing I remember trying to explain is that, you know, we try to enhance and enlarge the wetland around the quality spring coming out of the hill. And that's what we ended up doing. So for, as a result of that meeting, this is the first time I've been involved in a project like this, our mitigation plan involved now on-site mitigation of what we could save and continuing at the off-site mitigation bank, both. That was our new mitigation plan coming out of that hearing and process. That is what is permitted before you. I will pass around a copy of the approved TDEC permit, and Megan Plock is their staff person reviewing this. She's tough. She made us go through all the things. There are 20 conditions to protect that wetland. Long-term maintenance, other issues addressed in the permit. And I would want you to know that Mr. surdy has gone, in my view, an extra mile. We could not use low-impact development items to get our TDEC permit because you can't double credit. And we knew we were going to be dealing with Metro stormwater after this process, so there were other additional measures besides what's in that permit that were planned, and the other consultants will address with you later to further enhance the quality of the site and the water quality. My only point here is to let you realize a lot of work's gone into this, many iterations, and we certainly want to fair hearing and I know we'll get that and I, and I appreciate your earlier comments too because time is precious and you know we don't mitigate that at all but I do appreciate the hearing thank you thank you uh, at this time we'd like to open it up to anyone from the community who'd like to speak for or against please come to the podium and state your name and your addresses are, are typical name and address okay Good morning, my name is Micah Hargrove. I'm the director of the Mill Creek Watershed. I'm joined by Ms. Yvonne Jostin and Patricia Miller. Um, as far as an address, we're representing an organization, so how would you like me to respond? Uh, I guess we're okay with that. The Mill Creek Watershed Association, okay. um, familiar with them and, and their work in the area, so. You can give the organizational address. Okay, we have a PO box number, it's in East Nashville, close to my place of work. 
So to address the proposed plan as a new project, uh, we've got a couple of comments. Uh, the Mill Creek Watershed Association seeks to protect the waters and the wetlands within the watershed boundaries. The wetlands in question are part of a headwater source to Mill Creek, and as Southeast Nashville continues to grow, the need to protect our waters becomes increasingly important because once the wetlands are lost, they're gonna be forever altered and compromised. The proposed development requests a number of variances to wave storm water best management practices, buffer requirements, and multiple stream crossings that are less than 1,000 feet apart. At the previous committee meeting, the Mill Creek Watershed stated that the existing conditions, site constraints, and number of requested variances all demonstrate that the proposed use is not the best fit for the site. The Mill Creek Watershed Association cannot accept the plans as proposed. We ask the committee to uphold the stormwater regulations, deny the requested variances, and vote against the development as currently designed. The Mill Creek Watershed Association will accept and support a plan that avoids impacting wetlands and abides by state and local regulations, including wetland and stream buffer requirements and stormwater best management practices. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, my name is Lori Aldridge. I have a property directly across the street from this development, 2501 Lakeland Drive. Um, I'm new to this, so <laughs> um, I have just a few concerns. We've had this property since 2010 at Lakeland Drive. During this period of time, from 2010 till 2016, we've seen several um, things going on at this property across the street that um, impose the water and affected the water flow on 25-0 Lake, Lakeland, the water comes down McGavick Pike on our side as well as under McGavick Pike. So it runs on two waterways across, um, on our property. I don't know how to show that to you right now, but um, so on 2501 Lakeland, the creek comes through our property one direction and then it also comes down the side of our property. Um, with this proposed development across the street are one of our concerns we've been asking just for information on how are they going to protect the wetlands but not only that how is stormwater going to flow from here our concern is the more what are they doing to prevent more runoff that's going to be coming in and enroaching onto our property now as well as the wildlife that comes through that property now um, so I think that's our biggest concern and we haven't really had those answers Mr. Surti has reached out to us, but they have not been willing to provide us with any answers to any questions we've had, except for one drawing that did come from Council Member Jeff Syracuse. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And um, I'll say we'll hold those comments for just a minute, and we'll let them address them. Anyone else from the, the community want to speak on this? Seeing none, we'll close the community portion of the of the meeting, and uh, I'll turn it back to the. Thank you, Steve. I'll turn it back to the applicant. Uh, if there's any finishing remarks you, you want to make, uh, and also if you could try to address uh, her concerns, and this will, will be a good time to do so. Well, I, I want um, uh, Mr. Do George Dean to say something, but uh, I, I'm a little bit surprised about the last comment. They said they reached out to me mm -hmm. uh, to discuss any kind of concern. This is the first time I, I'm hearing, by the way. Uh, nobody has reached out to me uh, directly or indirectly, so I'm, I'm a little bit surprised by the comment. Uh, okay. But I, I do not know where, where the location of uh, uh, her residence is, uh, but I don't think the water is flowing north way, it's flowing south way, and I don't think Lakeland even uh, get affected uh, with this water. So, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to clarify that one. And I'm, I'm willing to talk to anybody after this meeting before, the, you know, and any time if they wanted to sit down and talk to me, I'm, I'm glad to do that. I will offer the same thing to the Mill Creek Watershed Association also, and I'll, I'll tell you in a later part what, what has happened there. But I want Mr. Dean to address this uh, committee. Well, I would say it, it may be better, I think it's more important to get, we had a historical overview, uh, and then we went to the public section. Really, the historical overview doesn't really doesn't give you anything. I, I prefer to have the engineers talk about the changes in the plan and what we're doing to try and accomplish 
what this committee is all about. Uh, and then I can come back if that, if that sounds okay. I, I, I think that's the more important thing to do right now. I would direct you not so much the changes in the plan. We're, we're seeing this anew, so just explain the plan as yeah. it is. Uh, yes, sir. And, and as you're explaining the plan, the drainage, uh, how it does come through the site, and uh, we can probably uh, pick up the concern from the community at that yeah. point, too. Yeah. You want to say? Identify yourself, please. Studio in Knoxville. All right. Excuse me. My name is Ben Pethel. I'm a landscape architect with the Penland Studio in Knoxville. Um, do we have access to sheet C300 for the screen? On the screen, we are turned, um, but for the north is towards the bottom of the screen. Um, plan north is towards the right side of the screen. So this project has undergone a number of changes, as you're all aware. Um, at its current state, oh, that'd be great if we can turn it. Any way to turn it 180 degrees? Two more. <laughs> two, more, two more clicks here. How about that? Outstanding. Thank you. So the, the footprint of the building, the building's been reduced in size. It's approximately 13,000 square feet. Um, it takes up a um, portion of the property. However, on 75% of the parking lot around the building, permeable pavers are proposed. It's, it's very similar actually to the parking lot outside this facility. Um, those permeable pa pavers are directing storm water as well as the roof drains through a um, bioretention area, which is shown, if I can get this pointer to work, outside of a zone two stream buffer right here. So that water is filtered as it goes through the permeable pavers and secondarily filtered um, within the um, bioretention area. And to address the concerns um, of the last speaker, um, the water coming off site will be cleaner than it is today. Um, regarding wildlife crossing, a large TVA um, power line runs through the east side of this property. The center of the power line is approximately right here. And we have submitted a plan through TVA, which they've approved, um, to plant underneath that power line. Um, what we have is, is several different zones. We have a rain garden at the upper portion. Um, we have a steep slope which is fully vegetated, and we have a secondary um, rain garden all within the, the power line easement. We have small trees on the perimeter um, as well as evergreen shrubs. Part of the requirements for TVA are access to that power line in the event of a major emergency. So um, we've accommodated that with a zone where vehicles could be taken through the parking lot or through this area here. So basically we've spaced trees, the small trees, um, where the vehicles can get through if needed. We have more or less typical landscaping around this perimeter here. Um, lots of evergreen trees to, um, to screen from residential areas, although we are dealing with the hillside. We have a reconstructed wetland in this area. And we have a very large area along this stream. And I'd like to talk about that a bit. Um, we have no construction whatsoever within the zone one buffer. We have minimal disturbance within the zone two buffer. Um, we'll 
look at the mitigation plan in just a moment, but the basic idea is unlike um, the previous project we discussed, our zone one is fully vegetated, um, no lawns. And our zone two buffer is predominantly vegetated without lawns. Um, this is a, a natural approach to landscaping. It's what we would like to do is go in um, on site, remove the invasive material and replace it with native material. But all the native material and the ground itself will not be disturbed. Um, it will all be protected and completely um, undamaged by the development. So if we could briefly look at sheet C300, I'm sorry, 301, which is our mitigation plan. This drawing is showing the, the planting that's proposed beyond what's required by the typical um, metro um, planting. So this wetland that's recreated, even though we've reaccommodated the wetlands offsite with a new wetland, um, this is a wetland area. We have rain garden, rain garden, and the entire stream buffer area. So together, um, our site is, is more than 70% um, permeable. Um, it's more than 50% fully vegetated. And we feel the impacts, um, well, we feel that the impacts um, will not be worse for water quality. We feel that the, the open TVA easement will allow a wildlife crossing um, as requested and that all comments received thus far from Metro have been addressed. So, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, any more comments from the applicant before we close down discussion? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Paul Williams, a civil engineer uh, from Maryville, Tennessee. Um, we uh, took the project that was uh, presented to you last month uh, we made several changes to the project to to address the the concerns that we uh, heard in the meeting. Um, we had an entrance to the property in the northern section. It <clears throat> it crossed the stream, impacted the buffer. We removed that entrance. We required two entrances by the um, Metro Fire people and uh, we relocated an entrance on a neighbor lot uh, to the south and you can look at the drawing and notice to the south which is to the left uh, there is a drive again i'll caution you this is not so much changes from the previous yeah. plan this is a new plan yeah. uh, so we don't uh, okay. blurry those lines anymore okay uh, there was um, like I say, we the, the design that we now have does not have uh, an encroachment on uh, Zone 1 along Mill Creek. Uh, we have established uh, rain gardens within the TVA easement with the permission of TVA. Um, um, and we have the wetlands um, remediation uh, basically on site with with the wetlands that we not with the wetlands with the rain gardens that we established um, the uh, we are still encapsulating a stream um, through a pipe but that has been addressed uh, previously uh, that it has T it has a uh, TDEC approval so I won't, won't belabor that but uh, we, we are not, uh, in our opinion, we are not crossing the stream, uh, a Mill Creek at, at all. We're not, we have a very limited encroachment. Uh, it was less than a hundredth of an acre or something okay. uh, on, the, on the zone two of the Mill Creek buffer. So 
Yes. All right, I thank you guys, I appreciate it. And we'll close down uh, to the committee. Chair, I, I think we have two more uh, people who would like to say a few things, so I would like you to give us a little bit more time so we can explain what's going on. Um, Larry is our project manager, he would like to say something, and then I would like to also say something. I just encourage you to keep it okay. moving pretty quick, okay. thank you. Yeah, I'll try to cut through some of the stuff that's already been discussed. This is, I'm Larry Bilski again with Horizon Hospitality Management, representing the developer. Um, we, I just want to, I'm, I'm going to address a couple of comments that were made uh, regarding one, two, and three initially, and uh, the first one being uh, the uh, infractions that uh, were made several years ago. Those have been addressed and, and the fines paid, and, uh, and we're going to, uh, if approved, We'll, re we'll resolve the issue of the existing pipe and the decap and encapsulation. Uh, one of the uh, number of comments was the site plan of record involves significant stream buffer uh, disturbances. The previous plan did, but this plan we have re we have taken out the parking lot that in that where a lot of that disturbance was. We still obviously have the wetlands disturbance and the buffer zone there, but, we, but by taking out that disturbance and by taking out the second entrance that we had, we've significantly reduced the buffer disturbances. And uh, we feel like we have, have are going, progressing forward in, in a manner to, to address your concerns. Uh, the, uh, we've got the support needed of the federal and state agencies as we've discussed and the Ramble environmental report. We've got a copy of that, and I believe that's in the, in the application. Yeah. And uh, that, oh, yes, sir. Uh, no, there's only one hotel, right? There's, there's only one hotel proposed with this development. I think the applicant may either own or have ties to the other property, which is not for us today. Um, I think what they were showing was partial TDEC information. Um, so our, our portion that's being heard today is, is just the hotel site that you previously seen. I'm not, not I think it's not the buffer, the parking lot location on the buffer was different than what you just showed and what I'm looking at now. And I, we've had comments from them that none of the parking is in the buffer anymore. And that's not what this plan that I'm looking at shows. So I'm trying to figure out what exactly. Okay, so. Um I was going to probably get to that after, but there's a there's a difference of opinion on uh, on what staff feels and what the applicant feels is the buffer disturbances. Um, okay. And okay. I could either explain now or explain no, after no, that. No, just wait. Okay. Just just wait. Yeah. Okay. No. I apologize. I Mr. Dean, would you like to say? I was asked just to come in and say a couple of things. Uh, one of the uh, my name is George Dean. Thank you. Two uh, uh, Nitzgren and White, and I represent the applicant. <clears throat> one of the problems we've had is trying looking at some of the, the regulations under the uh, code provisions and the internal operating procedures of the board. Um, uh, we feel like several of those are somewhat ambiguous. Uh, one of the problems when you're interpreting those kinds of provisions in a land use planning uh, proposal, such as one as you have here, is that Metro law requires that those ambiguous requirements be construed in favor of the property owner, not against the property owner. In other words, if there is a uh, ambiguity in the document, for example, the word driveway, 
in uh, uh, Table 6-3, uh, uh, I think the staff feels like there's a driveway. We don't feel like there's a driveway. Uh, as far as I could tell, there's no definition of the dri term driveway. Um, uh, there, there are a number of examples like that. Uh, to the extent that there is a dispute about that and ambiguity, the Tennessee Supreme Court requires that it be construed in favor of the property owner. I'll just give you one site. There's thousands of them basically in Tennessee. Ready Mix versus Jefferson County decided by the Tennessee Supreme Court in 2012. Uh, we've tried to parse the regulations and come as close as we possibly can to understanding, but the written code is the determination, not a construction of the written code. If it's ambiguous, it has to be construed in favor of the applicant, not the other way around. And we, we believe that our construction of the documents, that we um, uh, comply with all the regulations. Uh, but that's all I have to say. Uh, we think that everybody, there's been a number of applicants in the past who have similar kinds of uh, problems, has been construed favorably to them. We think that the board, and I know a number of members of the committee, I know you all do a great job. Uh, we think that um, in this case, that uh, we should also get the benefit of uh, the construction of the code that's favorable to our position. Thank you. Can I say something in closing? Briefly. Thank you. Um, I have been working on this project for more than a year and a half now, and um, uh, before we applied for the permit uh, with the Metro, uh, one of the things Mr. Chad uh, Rhodes, uh, who was uh, the, the engineer, brought to me, and it was the case number 2016 uh, 1234 uh, which was a village of Riverwood, and he says, uh, Metro does allow uh, wetland uh, mitigations, and uh, as long as you work with TDAC and get a permit from PDAC and Army Corps of Engineers, he says, uh, you know, we should be fine. And I read that uh, meeting and the briefing of the meeting, and the, it wasn't approved, and the reason was, uh, the, the comment was made, the reason for approval are that the corps had signed up, TDEC had requested mitigation, and the applicant will provide it, therefore will approve this, this uh, uh, variance request. Uh, they requested a mitigation of uh, wetland of 0 0.308. We are requesting half the size of that mm, uh, mitigations. Uh, I have tried to comply, and uh, I, have, I have gone to TDEC, I have gone to Army Corps of Engineers, and I have uh, talked to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and uh, you know, we have been very, very responsible about proper mitigation. I have sat down with the Metro, and I says, you know, please let me know if you need more mitigation, if you need me to do something more, let me know what I need to do. And they says, well, Mr. Suri, provide on-site mitigations as much as you can. As of right now, my building occupies about 13% of this space. 87% of my space is dedicated to the pavers, parking lot, and, and the green, green space. I can't squeeze any more. I'm, I'm encapsulating this stream with, a, with the you know, guidelines that is provided by the state, federal, and um, the Metro does not have any kind of guidelines how to uh, encapsulate the, the uh, uh, the stream, but I have seen all over the, uh, the city that encapsulation is very common. Every crossing you go through uh, has a, an encapsulation, so the, it's not going to disturb or de deteriorate the water quality. We are filtering the water on site as much as we can. As a matter of fact, we meet the LID requirement and we are meeting the stormwater requirement also. So we are very, very responsible as far as filtering the water. So. What I'm saying is I'm willing to do whatever it takes to do for me to mitigate in addition to what I'm doing with the TDAC and Army Corps of Engineers. And I have offered all kind of options. I have offered almost 100% of my site as a mitigation. So what more do I need to do in order to comply or pro to, to provide this, uh, this city? Um, I'm confused with the codes because there are no specific codes. They just write these statements, but there is no specific code that they tell me to look at. So I do not know what to follow. If there is a code, if there is a description, why I read this 6.9, it's so vague. There's nothing out there. So if you tell me what I'm supposed to do, then I will do it. So what I'm saying is I, I have a state and the federal 
agencies who says, Mr. Suri, what you are doing is right. We are in agreement with you. We are approving. I have the permit from them. And I'm simply asking you to do me a favor, help me out. I will do whatever it takes me to do. To, to satisfy further. If you say, Mr. Suri, do some more mitigation on a you know, uh, Milk Creek Watershed Association, and if they want something mitigated on their side, I will do it. But please let me do this project, because it's good for the city. It's going to produce a lot of revenue for the city. This side is sitting there. It's a dumping ground. People, irresponsible people, bring all kinds of junk into it. You think after my project is complete, the water is going to get dirty. You should see the quality that goes into that water right now. So I am trying to clean it up. And this is my opportunity to clean it up. And I, I just need your help. So with that, you know, please do consider my request. Uh, it is a good request. I, I, I think this project is very, very good for me. Mm -hmm. It's good for the city. All right, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, before we completely close it down, uh, Mr. Rhodes, I'll, I'll look to you. Uh, could you explain the, any pass through water, what water is coming from off site through your site, and maybe specifically look at the community concern? Uh, how are you treating any pass through water, or collecting, or sending any water through the site? Well, uh, the pass through water, there is uh, some pass through water through the, from the, okay, I guess. Uh, I felt like uh, this gentleman it kind of addressed that with the visual that you had up there showing the bioretention area. Mm -hmm. The flow comes from the west down the hillside, uh, flows into that the new wetland area we could create, that we did create, and then there's a pass-through pipe, and that's the 98 foot of linear foot of stream mitigation, and that takes it out and into the bioretention area so that we treat it before it goes to the stream. The stream is at the north east corner of the property and it comes down from McGavick but then it cuts to the east away from our site. It doesn't go all the way through the site as you saw uh, and it's close to the TVA easement so the flow through our site is all being routed to the bioretention area. Everything on our site property proper okay. so uh, and the routing is from the north to the east away from us kind of through us and with the buffers we're just letting that roll beyond us and we're not really doing anything with that, just protecting it and make sure the water quality going into it is good. So run on from uh, above the site would go to the bioretention area, be treated before it got to Sims Branch. The, the runoff from our site on property lines goes to the retention area. There is a pass through pipe besides okay. the mitigation that takes it on out under the parking lot, the area that is not generated on our site. And that pipe is sized large enough so that it won't back up yes. water on the adjacent this properties. Gentleman, yes. This gentleman with the glass that sized that pipe, you can tell him what okay. size. Uh, something we've not mentioned is we have reconstructed the, the moderate uh, level of, of uh, wetlands on our site. There is wetlands on the adjacent site between the spring head and, uh, and our site. So there is an area to clean the water that comes out of the spring, which is clean water to begin with, but, uh, but it comes through a wetlands area before it gets to our site. So any off-site water from the community concern would pass through the site. Yes. Pipes are sized probably so you feel in your opinion that it won't back up any water onto that side, it won't cause any issues ab above that? That's correct. Okay. Um, does that come close to addressing the community concern? Um, well, I think our, should I just stand here? Uh, briefly, yes. Oh, okay. Nah, that's, that's a good point, yeah. I'm trying to go fast and trying to get on the record at the same time. Sorry, I'm not as nervous this time. I think the biggest concern is I understand and respect all the cleanliness. Right now, as is where I sat at 2501 um, Lakeland Drive and Mr. Surti, that's the Montessori School, if that remember, jogs your memory. Um, the way the creeks and the runoff run down our property north to south as well as east, um, this particular development is now going to in, um, roll into and drain into the east part of this creek. Right now, as this property is, there's already flooding concerns. All of this runoff down McGavick Pike goes into a three and a half, four foot culvert that is on private property. Um, not mine, but somebody's. And 
so my concern is where is all this excess water going to go? Because as these properties stand today, there is already flooding and erosion of the properties there. So I, I'm trying to get validation as to how is this, this naturally is going to be more water usage right there as, as is. So I'm just trying to get some understanding as to how that is going to be helped. Because right now, with storm water, it's, it's a mess over there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Briefly, sir. Uh, the, by the use of pavers, mm -hmm. the soil tests have been run. We can get percolation under the stone that's under the pavers. There'll be actually less water coming off this site after construction is complete than now. A considerably less water will, will come off the site. So flooding will not be any concern. Oh. Thank you for that, and uh, uh, I guess I'll look at staff too. That when this comes for a grading permit, or if it gets to that point, uh, I know you guys will also look at this uh, further and make sure pipe sizes and, and whatever comes to be will be. But it does sound like they have a pass-through plan for that water, and uh, uh, they will have to make sure that it doesn't come through if that addresses the community concern. And all right, I apologize, but uh, I got cut cut short, and I'm, I'm going to drop off everything I was going to discuss, and and I'd like to address a couple of the last two comments that are in your summary of the variance request. Very briefly. Okay. Because we need to do this along. Okay. One of the other comments was that the site plan of record has significant aquatic resource disturbances. Uh, we have the proper reports that show there is no aquatic life existing in that spring. The spring water that comes through the property that we want to, that we're discussing, is an is one is a stream that is dry during the summertime primarily, or at least it's, it's subject to 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 weather, wet weather conditions. There are periods in time where there's there's no life in there at all. The study shows there is no aquatic life in there. The uh, and then another comment that made in addressing again uh, Micah's uh, comments from the Mill Creek Association. This, the, your comment from the committee is the site is within the Mill Creek watershed habitat of the endangered Mill Creek crayfish. That is a correct statement, but it is a very general and broad statement. The Mill Creek watershed, as you all know, looking at a map, encompasses a huge area of, 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 ten, of this portion of Nashville, Tennessee. But that does not mean that the crayfish exists in every single stream that's within that watershed. It has certain streams that are, that are adaptable to its habitat. And using the TDEC 2014 D list, which is noted in your in your documents and your summary request, referring to the Mill Creek Association's uh, comments about the crayfish, this branch is not identified as a habitat of the crayfish. Okay. And uh, we discussed this last round, and, I'm, and and also we have the necessary study was done and paid for by Mr. Surdy by BDY environmental consultants who determined that there is no aquatic life in the stream and that there is no crayfish in the Sims Branch Creek in front of the property. So I, that's, and we have the support of the Fish and Wildlife Management Agency, the support of uh, Tennessee Wildlife Management Agency, and they, they find and agree with this report. All right. So, yeah. We, we need to move this on, guys. We need to close this down. Uh, we appreciate your time and effort. Uh, Ma'am, I see your hand, but the community portion is closed. Uh, uh, so let's move this into uh, committee discussion. And so I'll, I'll get started. Chairman, did staff have some comments that they were going to make? I'm sorry. Good call. No, I appreciate that. Um, staff? I want to explain the... Uh, the difference in opinion as far as the buffers, and it will be uh, it'll be on sheet 102. You're doing 102E, is that? 102E, yes. yes. Yeah, exactly. I had questions about that myself. Here, here. So Before you get started, Steve, I mean, um, you know, there was a comment made early on that maybe we had some kind of preconceived notions. You know, we are given a package of information, and when I see something that has this, this much information on it, it creates a concern for me immediately, okay? So, uh, but I think you'll historically find that I'm a person that's going to try to help you 
I'm a problem solver by the trade, that's what I do, but uh, this initially concerned me, and to a certain extent we've talked so much, I need to dummy this down just a little bit, and I think maybe Steve will, will help. Go ahead, Steve. Okay, so this is the entrance. This is the entrance to the site right here, and along with the entrance, there's this drive and parking and drive and parking, and this cuts through the buffer, and this area right through here and right through here is sections that we included within the buffer disturbance. So our buffer disturbance is 0.3 acres, uh, give or take a little bit, uh, and their buffer disturbance does not include some of this and some of this because they consider that dry vials. Um, so I, I don't think because they disagree with staff that makes it ambiguous, ambiguous. whatever that, yes. <laughs> Just because they disagree, I don't think it's, uh, that we should, uh, we should say that there's a, a gray area. We've, you know, historically, you know, said a crossing is like the one that they got rid of. This one right here, a perpendicular crossing, is what we consider a crossing. Uh, this over here, when it includes parking, and this one over here, which includes parking, is it's not something that we've historically ever considered uh, a, a, a just a driveway crossing. So, so that, that's the biggest difference between us of 0.31 acres. Um, it says 0.311 acres and their acreage of, of disturbance. So the blue dashed line that runs to the site, it is a stream, is that correct? Well, so it's very tricky. See, right over here, if you look right over here, there's a purple line, and that's actually a, I think that's their wetland uh, area. And then along with that wetland, there's a stream determination in there. So they, they showed uh, the wetland and the top of the bank and buffers based on the wetland buffers and the, the stream buffers. So where, where, where's the wetland again? Show us uh, it's, I think it's this purple one right here that's a little squiggly line that runs through the property. And, and you agree with that line? That's, that's based on their, their determination. Okay. Well, let's say absent, let's say that there was no wetland there at all. You still have a stream, correct? I believe so. Okay, and then that stream has a buffer. Exactly. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Sardi, I have a couple of questions. Um, do you know what the property is zoned? What is the zoning of this property? CL. CL. And how many stories is this existing building? Uh, uh, proposed building? Five story. Five story building. Um, how long have you owned this property? Since 95. Ni 1995? Yes. Uh, you, I assume you own other hotels? <laughs> Not at this point. You don't? This is, this is your first? This is my first, uh, okay. I have a partner of, who is Okay. Uh, well, I noticed, you know, this footprint seems to be fairly typical of a lot of hotels that we've done, that we've worked around. Um, I don't know how high CL allows you to go, probably five stories is the maximum. Um, Councilman, I, <laughs> uh, it was the footprint, uh, as a matter of fact, you are the one who had designed that footprint for okay. me. Okay, so. there you go. So that, that, <laughs> that footprint looks very familiar to me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and, but I guess what I was trying to say, I did this on another site somewhere, is what you're saying? Not this site, right? This site. I've worked on this site? Yes, sir. <laughs> I didn't know that. Well, I guess I'd better recuse myself. <laughs> So, I have to recuse myself, it sounds like. <laughs> All right. The, uh, uh, just a quick comment, uh, response, I'm sorry, Steve, yes, Ms. Shue. Yes, sir. Uh, I think part of the confusion also is, is I'm just looking at item number eight in the proposed uh, variances is allow proposed drive aisles to be counted as driveway crossings. Uh, we envision that as one crossing. Uh, we, aren't, we aren't requesting that uh, the board consider, the committee consider that dr the front drive is one crossing and the rear drive is another crossing. I'm not sure, we're not sure where this, how this language arrived. Yeah. Um, it's just one, I'm, I'm, did you? Yeah, I want to just clear up this issue about the stream. In that document I passed around to you, the state permit, it does refer to it as a de minimis yes. uh, qual water quality is what they determined at TDEC for that stream passing through. So it's defined and it's in before you there. Uh, we keep dis discussing what it is, but it's, 
that 98 to 138 linear foot passing through is a de minimis quality uh, stream that uh, we're that's part of the mitigation plan. It's a wetland and stream mitigation plan. So, so that, de minimis by TDEC. That that's what TDEC uh, in their determination after review of our report. That's what they labeled it, and you have that before you. Their labeling of it in their document. So I just wanted to define it for you what they TDEC said. So. All right, and the Corps is also waiting on this, or we're still waiting for a Corps permit number? Uh, yeah, the Corps has been contacted since seven, eight months ago. Mr. Carnes is processing that permit. Mr. Wilder has already emailed us basically an approval email. I don't know why we're still waiting on paperwork, but but we are. Uh, so, you know, the, the uh, Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife both weighed in on the crayfish issue. And it was out in the, the main stream, and they determined no impacts from this project. And they, we got those no impact letters as well. So. Okay, we thank you. Thank Mr. you, sir. Mr. Chairman, I, yes. I have one quick question for the applicant. I seem to recall at the last hearing that your TDEC permit, and that's been referenced a lot during this time, that it had been appealed. Has, has that gone through? Is that the case? And has that been resolved? The uh, appeal uh, was filed by the uh, the Watershed Association, Mill Creek Watershed Association, and they had identified about 10 points. And um, uh, we addressed all the 10 points, and we are in compliance with all the 10 points. Uh, so TDEC, uh, I talked to them before uh, this meeting, and I asked them, where does my permit stand? And they said, you, Mr. Sir, you have a valid permit, and you can go ahead and tell the staff that your permit is valid. Uh, TDEC has uh, also tried to reach out to Mill Creek Water Association several times, and they have not been able to set up a meeting. Uh, but if there is a challenge, the challenge probably will not be stand because we have addressed all the 10 concerns that they have, and we have incorporated all the comments. In addition to our original understanding, what they had told us in the beginning, uh, was completely changed when they filed the appeal and they added 10 more concerns. So we say, okay, we'll just go ahead and address all the 10 concerns. So we address all of them. Now they come back and say, oh, we're just against the project. So, uh, but as far as the permit is concerned, I, right, thank the you. I says, you are fine. There's no problem. Right. Right. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers um, uh, just sent me a note uh, the other day, and they requested a cultural resource survey mm -hmm. before they issued the permit. And I had a uh, uh, consultant who went there on the site on Friday last week, and uh, they confirmed that there is no cultural uh, resources uh, that should be concerned. So they sent the letter to the Army Corps of Engineers. I talked to the Mr. Wilder on Monday, and Mr. Wilder says, Mr. Surdy, it's just a bureaucratic process. Your permit is coming your way. So uh, that's all we are waiting for right now. So uh, staff and Steve, are we okay encapsulating that stream? Is, is that... Um, I mean, they've got TDEC permits, they've, they've waited on core. I'm waiting for staff to say that we agree with all that or we don't agree with all that, or what's staff's position on encapsulating that stream? <laughs> or Michael, or Mr. Hunt. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we have to consider when we're looking at these projects is what's the direction Metro has instructed our office to pursue. And when we go back to past council ordinances and past stakeholder group committees like the Green Ribbon Committee, the Nashville Now, Nashville Next, one of the things that is consistently passed on to our office is a desire to get all listed streams off the 303D list. When we evaluate what historically has led to streams going on to the 303D list, it is the impacting of headwater streams, headwater stream buffers. So I think given our marching orders, so to speak, in that regard, that's sort of how we look at projects, provide the committee feedback, and then you can consider the various hardships and elements relating to each of these respective projects. But I think from a scientific perspective, it is clear that headwater streams are pr very pertinent to water quality matters. Um, so I guess that's the perspective staff comes with. And, right. and if I could add one thing on the engineering side, um, when we do look at these, I mean, obviously they have to get your approval. We don't, we don't allow the encapsulation of any stream 
um, without a variance unless we're talking about a simple driveway culvert that, uh, or driveway crossing. Um, but we do ask when they do a, a crossing when it's a stream that it's a bottomless crossing. Mm -hmm. um, and this is not a bottomless, so part of the variance, if you do choose to approve it, uh, you would be approving it as a culverted versus an open bottom crossing. Thanks for the distinguishing. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Difference. Uh, I am willing to do the bottomless uh, culvert, so, you know, because if that is, that is desirable and I was concerned structurally it could cause problem, but I talked to my engineers and they said we can do the bottomless, so we are actually doing the bottomless. Uh, it probably is not on the drawing, but, uh, you know, that has been discussion between uh, my engineers uh, and myself, so I am going to do the bottomless. I appreciate you being open to that. Yeah. Mr. Severe, you were about to speak. Yeah, if I could just get staff to clear some things for me, because I want to make sure I understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Best I can tell, we're talking about disturbing two different water quality, two different water sources or streams. We've yes, got sir. So there's a, uh, towards the uh, the bottom of the site uh, next to McGavick, it's, uh, as Chet Rhodes had talked about, we uh, we analyzed that, that stream. Our maps came up as over a square mile, but when we did a little bit more research. Hold on, one, one second. So you're, now you're talking about what they consider also wetlands. Well, I think you were referencing, uh, we're talking about two different streams. Right. What, yeah, which one are you talking about there's, now? There's this one right here. Okay. And then there's this one right here with that very blue right there. Okay. So let's talk. So let's pick one and talk about and tell me about that one. So this is the one right here is okay. the uh, the major uh, major trip right here, and that's the one that's um, you know probably 550 to 600 acres, and water year round, um, always flowing. Well, it's a stream, so um, stream defined by watershed area then. Uh, well, also by by people physically going out there and making determinations. Okay. Um, so you have buffer disturbance over here as part of this stream along so with... So we got zone two, zone two buffer going into the drive aisle. Yes. yes. And then there's also a little smidgen right there. Parking spot. Okay. And, and then I think, let me... There could be some right here, uh, water quality uh, features, uh, bioretention. That's, is that not in the buffer? No. It, okay. The, the border of the uh, bioretention area is the 50 foot buffer. Okay, so uh, along this one, we're talking about right over here and right over here. Okay. And then no, you have this no, tricky let's go, one. No, st let's stay on that one. Yeah. Why are they encapsulating that stream? Right here, they are not. They're not. Okay, this so that's not going in a pipe at all. That's not. No. Okay, no, so sir. the only disturbances over there, we're talking about zone two in that drive, and then a little bit in that parking spot. Right. Okay. All right. Now, so let's move to this. So that's one. That's one issue. There's no. There's no crossings. There's no nothing. Those are the only two things. Today, there's. This is an existing, and then there's a. I think an unpermitted uh, pipe that exists today. Okay. But, but I think you're correct on the. The, the creek along the Magai Pike, we are not disturbing okay. at all. We are leaving it intact. Okay. So now let's talk about the other area. Because to me, there's just two different issues, and everything's just getting thrown in. People keep talking, and I can't tell what we're talking about. <laughs> I mean, I, and it's very confusing that there's a stream and a wetland together in this. And, and, and I need you to explain that to me because I think I understand. But why is it both a stream and a wetland? Who's determined this? And what I'm really struggling with is in the past, from my, what I recall, is that anytime TDEC has approved something, we've gone along with it and said it's okay. And so I want to know, and I think we tried to discuss it a minute ago, but I want to understand exactly what. What's different here? Because it seems to me that everything in the past, that's what we've done. And I think it was even brought up by an applicant, and I think he's got a point there, so I'm trying to understand that. I'll, I'll defer to Michael on if he has any better information than I do on. Okay. The, but, but the, the stream, if you could help me define what, what exactly is the stream here, because it's because I okay. do also see that. So the stream is to the here. Extent, to the extent we allow this to be encapsulated, so it's no longer a wetlands, then I, I do see the point that this is no longer a crossing, sort of. I mean, it's it's mm. no longer, certainly the buffers no longer make sense. I mean, it's underground. Yeah. So, so, so if you could describe to me how it's all that makes it. well I'll just give you the uh, overall stream stream wetland boundary okay the stream is based on watershed area no sir you go out there and there's water in it is that correct yes it's um, 
Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's been designated as a stream. It's yes. gone through the designation process, and it is a stream. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Or they wouldn't be getting a permit for it. The, the question the gentleman asked is the subject of the first Rambo report that I referenced. They spent a lot of time answering your question. What is it? And it was a combination of a wetland area. It's basically the foot of a hill where a straight spring comes out and then runs across the flat area and spreads out. Well, that, what I heard so is that the stream comes, the, the spring comes out above this property because there's wetlands yeah. above the property. Well, the, yeah, but there is a spring coming out on the property on the west embankment where the proposed uh, wetland is being enlarged as part of our mitigation plan. So just to the west of the parking area there, if you could show. It's very uh, difficult when the north is. Wide. Yeah. <laughs> west is at the top where north normally is, okay? Yeah. If, as you look at it. So at the top of the page you're looking at, just above the parking area, that is the area where the high quality wetlands were determined to be. And that's the area we're trying to enlarge to mitigate wetlands on site. Okay, when you say enlarge, you're talking about the area above the parking. Yeah, do you see that little pink area above the parking? There's you're enlarging. Small, there's a little small area now. That's existing in pink. But the other area is we're widening that out. We, on our mitigation plan, you'll see that getting much bigger because we're trying to actually mitigate on site, create wetlands where there are none now. So, okay. Well, Maybe you show me the Sorry, I got a little where light. light. So off. this area right here is where That's the that comes out. And then the flow spread. And, and the Rambo report got into habitat, type of species, and everything. And the state and Rambo and Byron from Brentwood both agreed it was a moderate resource that deserved saving of what we could, which is why we did the off-site mitigation and as much on-site as we could. So um, I'm trying to answer your question. Is it a stream? Yearly, it's not always flowing, but seasonally, it's wet. The state, in the letter before you in the permit, have declared it a de minimis stream. So there's a small stream. We encapsulate 138 foot of it in the project through that area. So it's not really a stream, but it is by definition, and the state has determined it to be. But if you went out there, you'd be hard pressed to say that's a stream. Uh, I'm trying to answer your question. Yeah. You did, thank you. Mr. Rhodes, while you're there, that existing pipe for the two head walls, is that the, the existing pipe that will be taken out? I, I, I'm trying to understand if this pipe is what's being taken out. Yeah. Send that right right there is a headway. Right there. Yeah, send that. Paul is the engineer that did that pipe. So that, that pipe's coming out? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Can we point to that pipe in just for the record? Sure. That's, right there. That's the one that's coming out, so that will come off. Right. Off. And here's the new pipe. And he, here is the headway, which is the adjoining property. That's where the stream is coming out. So the wetland in this area is untouched, <coughs> and then we are creating an additional wetland uh, right here, which, which is about 100, and, 100 feet by uh, 13 feet. Yeah, so we will be preserving a good wetland right there in that area. And we have a contract with the TDAC to maintain it for five years. So we'll be mon TDAC will be monitoring for five years. We already paid the fees in order to have that thing properly maintained for five years. Okay. And right. just to clarify, one thing that keeps getting bounced around is is this level of this wetlands. And and I just want to, I think what in the in the Rambo report, which which uh, Chet had just referenced. TDEC had sent out a, a sent out a letter and and stated that this could be a moderate of wetlands of moderate resource value. Okay. Also stated that it needed to be looked at to see if it qualified as a low resource value, and as a result of that, the Rambo report went out and did the investigation, and their determination was that it did not meet the standards of a moderate resource value wet stream and was therefore reclassified, or I should say classified affirmatively as a de minimis stream. So there's a little bit of a history because his word moderate resource value keeps popping up and it is not, it's de minimis. Okay, thank you for clarification. Mr. Galvez. Okay, All right, like Mr. Slade, let me see if I can uh, uh, unclutter our understanding about some of the key points. Um, and I, I really appreciate Mr. Slade going through that very uh, 
judicial process of clarifying the, the degrees of impact and the specific nature of the impact. So um, I'll go ahead and jump into concerns and, and comments rather than more questions because I, I, I think I understand it. The basis for my vote when we last discussed the pieces of this proposal that are the same, encapsulating the stream, removing a wetland, was that we're encapsulating a stream and removing a wetland that has values that staff have stated are important and that uh, research has stated are important. Uh, st headwater streams of this nature uh, could be defined de minimis in their nature by virtue of the fact that they're in a headwater. They're not low in the watershed, they're high in the watershed, they don't flow year round because they're in the headwater. And that's exactly why they function in such a critical nature in our community. Uh, water moves very slowly through a headwater stream. Uh, and because of that, those types of streams, even just within a stream boundary, behave like wetlands. They, uh, it, it's been, there was a study in the journal Science 15, 20 years ago that did a metadata analysis of, I, I can't remember, but there was dozens of water quality studies around the nation, collected all the data to see if some common conclusions could be reached, but because normally you don't have that much data to collect and to analyze, and they found out that headwater streams remove up to 90% of nitrogen and significant amounts, around 50%, if I'm remembering properly, of, of phosphorus. So that's just the stream itself. Then when you combine a, a geographic feature that is uh, uh, wide enough and flat enough to accommodate an adjacent wetland in the buffer, uh, that's kind of the, the best of all worlds. Uh, so, um, and, and, and another factor of consideration of this board, as it's been said many times, water quality is our focus. I, I, think, I think we can also consider water quantity because that's how water gets treated, is by treating the quantity of the water and the way it gets treated. Uh, is that um, uh, we, have a, we have a valuable asset here, and a lot of times the reason we find them degraded is because people have degraded them. I, I've made the analogy in the past that you know, you, you go out and buy a new Mercedes, you wreck it, you bend up one fender, all of a sudden you got a de minimis Mercedes. But we don't keep it that way. We take it to the body shop, we fix the fender, and then we've got the Mercedes, almost the Mercedes we had before. Uh, it's wrecked, but it looks great, it's solid, it's functional, it's retained most of its value. That's the way we should be describing these types of natural resources. They have, they have investment potential. And I think that's what the Mill Creek Watershed Association is representing. And I think that's what the neighbors are representing when they talk about losing the sponginess of the landscape. Um, nothing you can do on that site will replicate what's already being done on that site. I, 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 I appreciate the comment that was said that the runoff will be reduced, but empirically, I've never found that to be the case. Um, and, and I've said on the public record many times that you know, you could take a typical lot like this, you could add a hotel, you could cover it in living walls, green walls, you put a green roof on it, put rain gardens all around it, put in porous paving, and you'll still do only about 60% of what a native forest does or what a native wetland does in terms of water quality treatment, water absorption, and water retention. Because it's also sending it to a huge savings account under the ground a vertical silo of water storage called the regolith of the planet, the geologic structure of the planet. So without that nozzle on the surface to allow that water to go down, that silo, hundreds of yards deep, will not be filled, and that flood water is going to be sent downstream to the next applicant. So um, I, I, I applaud the applicant for working extremely hard with the state and working extremely hard with the core and with ex extremely hard with this committee to come up with what I think is an excellent design on a drier site. This is a very wet site. Um, on, on the point that we have gone along with the state and the core in the past, that is true, but as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story 
is that for those sites, a wetland at Metro Center and a farm pond wetland that the state and the Corps both said could be easily mitigated, we went along with that. And I distinctly remember our chairman saying, but Metro government and this board has the prerogative of going beyond the state and federal positions on these matters. Um, so, uh, our previous vote to me, uh, as I remember, was that if, if the dry part of this site were developed more vertically, the zone two disturbances of the larger stream would probably be something that we could work with. We're encapsulating a stream, we're removing a wetland. I, I applaud you for trying to go beyond most developers who come to us with the wetland mitigation you're proposing and the porous paving and all the other things that you're doing. It just won't do what these sites normally do. Uh, it's, it's been thoroughly documented. Uh, and, and that was the basis on which we made our previous decision. I do not see how we can make any other decision based upon what was presented. What seems to have been presented are changes that allow this case to be technically redefined as a new proposal. It doesn't change the substance of our previous vote. It doesn't change the substance of our previous concerns. I, I wish it were different, but those are the characteristics of the site. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Goldman. Mr. That's, Chairman, that's can I respond to this a little bit? Um, because I, I think this is very interesting. I, if well, the preservation of the water is the, is the only concern, leaving this bottomless, uh, you know, the culvert will not deteriorate or not affect the water quality any, any which way. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to understand mm -hmm. if I am leaving the water as it is and not disturbing and I'm putting the cover on it, I think I'm, 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 I'm complying with what you are looking for. So please tell me, what am I doing that is going to dis destroy the quality of the water? I'm not destroying the water. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to do the open uh, culvert. So please, uh, you know, please understand that it, before we were planning to put it in a pipe, but now I'm trying to, you know, just leave the bottom open. There, therefore, there, there will be no impact on the water quality coming from the headway all the way to where the water goes. So I, I think uh, the, 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 this committee need to, needs to understand and address that. So there is, there is a reduction of water quality. So a three-sided pipe uh, provides more water quality than, say, an encapsulated pipe, but it's not the same water quality you get from an open buffer. The sunlight, the plants, the interaction between those all come together to provide a lot more water quality. And even though there's um, currently not documented uh, aquatic life in this, it doesn't mean that there wouldn't be if it was uh, uh, left alone for a while and, and brought back. So a three-sided culvert provides more water quality, but it doesn't provide nearly the same water quality as the buffers itself, itself does. Um, how, how does the determination made between development projects that are proposed as to where you can encapsulate a stream that has the same benefits that you're discussing and the wetlands and the and the soils conditions and then one developer said you can encapsulate the stream and you can mitigate this wetlands and then on another site you've got the same questions. I know it comes down to uh, quantifying the mitigation and uh, and then presenting it basically to a variance board like this because quantifying that mitigation is not always apples to apples. It's not, uh, uh, the science is still um, being determined in some ways. So it's not always easy, but the try to come, you know, get the mitigation quantified and then bring it to a board uh, similar to this. And like I said, we all bring different ideas uh, to the table of, of what mitigation works and what mitigation doesn't work. Um, but it's, it's the exact process you're going through to, to find this out and to work this stuff. Um, because it, it is um, developing in some ways and it, it comes down to a matter of opinion from water quality boards as this. So you're going through the proper channels to get this figured out and to understand, and this is the proper channels to figure out what you can and can't do. And Mr. Chairman, I, I might add one other thing that would help. Um, I, um, 
it's true that we've encapsulated a lot of streams in Davidson County. And by virtue of that fact, what remains has a heightened sense of value to our community because so much of the apple has been eaten. And so the apple that's left is all we're gonna have to enjoy going into this next growth phase that we're already very deeply in the middle of. Um, and, and to answer your question more specifically, it's a site-by-site -site specific impact. We've, we've approved three-sided culverts on sites that didn't totally encapsulate a stream on the entire site that, that was not eliminating wetlands that could not be completely mitigated uh, by human means. Um, and, um, um, and we've made allowances for that based upon the site characteristics and the nature of the resource. This resource is receiving opposition because of its characteristics and because of its capacity to serve the community. And normally we don't see that kind of opposition with proposals that we tend to grant as well. I, I I'm really stunned now, um, and uh, I, I should say one thing. I, I am really feeling that I am being treated differently than other people. And, and, and I, I am reaching out to you and I'm telling you I'm willing to do whatever it takes. But it appears that, that this, this, this staff and this committee is determined to turn down my project. I'm not a fresh family who got the permission, permission to remove almost one acre of land. I'm not a Piedmont. I'm a simple, small, average citizen of this, of this uh, city. And I'm trying to do everything right. And I'm doing everything right. And, and TDEC says you are doing everything right. The federal agency says you are doing everything right. I'm willing to bend as much backward as I possibly can. And I said, show me other options. Give me other options. And I will, I will work with you. I'm willing to work with you. I'm do they say, Mr. Surdy provide more mitigation. I dedicated 87% of my land for the mitigations. I am buying half an acre of land to create another wetland two and a half times more than what I'm disturbing. I'm leaving almost a one third of an a wetland on the site. I'm proposing, even if I have to create a new wetland, I'm proposing that let's use the 30 feet buffer zone. I will do it. But I think the bottom line is I'm being treated differently. I think the, the bottom line is the interest is to kill the project. It's not preservation because I'm preserving as much as I could. If preservation was the only concern, then I'm providing enough preservations. What more do you want? There is no definition in the Metro Code anywhere how much uh, mitigation I need to provide. I have dedicated over 100% of my land, equivalent to my land, as, as mitigations. So where is the problem? And what do I really need to do? Which code do I need to follow? And why I am being treated differently when you are giving permission after permission after permission to other people for doing the same thing or more than what I'm doing. So please accept, you know, my apologies for getting a little bit frustrated, but you know, I have spent enough time and then in 2002, I didn't realize I was very sick. I was almost on a dead bed and my engineer came to you and asked for a permission to put a parking lot so we can rent the parking lot to the city, uh, the airport. And they denied the permission. So they find excuse after excuse after excuse and says, we're not gonna allow you. What is it that is so important that you deny me than people out there doing as much or more damage to the wetland and to the spring? As a matter of fact, right now, from January till today, right across the street from Magavik Pike, near me. There is a heavy equipment sitting on the middle of the water that everybody's concerned about crayfish and water damage and all those things. They've been working on it, putting 60-inch pipeline for the metro. Nobody's worried about it. And all of a sudden, everybody's concerned about my property. So I want to understand, I, I want a fairness. I, I think you guys need to give me a fair treatment and you need to give me a permission to build these things. In return, I guarantee you, I will do whatever I need to do. 
So, you know, I just want an, a, a, an opportunity to develop this site because this site is in a very bad shape and it's gonna to continue to be in a very bad shape. I cannot monitor this site at night. Mm -hmm. Illegal people come and dumpster. So if, if your concern is to keep the site clean, let me develop the project, the site will be very clean. The water quality will be very clean. So, please, I hear please help me out. I hear your concerns and I, 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 I don't think we're treating you any, any differently because of this piece of property is much different than most pieces of property. The fact of the two streams coming together um, and, and the wetlands on the property, you have a, a lot of natural resources on the property that um, have a value. There are no natural resources. Uh, Chairman, uh, excuse me. We have studied that, that says there are no natural resources. I mean, it, to challenge those st studies, I have spent a lot of time and money getting those reports and I didn't pay them to write something. These are independent uh, contractors. They don't write something just to make me happy. They have gone there. TDEC has gone there. Army Corps of Engineers has gone there. Fish and Wildlife has gone there. Everybody has gone there. They have concluded that there's nothing that is significant out there. There's no wildlife out there. It's nonsense. You know, there, there's no crayfish in, the, in that area. The, the, the reports are very clear. So we can go back and say, continue to say, oh, yeah, there is crayfish, there is this, there is this, there is this. It's not there. So what are we trying to protect except to punish Mr. Suri because Mr. Suri should not be doing this project? Quick question uh, about your um, permit or the the um, notification that you're going to, you're going to be getting from the Army Corps. When when do you expect that? I think you said you had a preliminary um, email approving it. Or but when are they expecting for a? It's it's just a bureauc um, bureaucratic process. They are uh, waiting for the, uh, uh, the the report that they asked for uh, for the cultural resource, meaning uh, you know see if there is a, any kind of evidence that uh, red Indians were in that area or but there are any kind of evidence. But they haven't provided like and an ETA within a month, within the next couple of weeks, or anything. Like oh, that. It, it's definitely within a month. Yeah, Thank thirty you. days. Mr. Chairman, um, I, I think it'd be helpful to address the point of fairness as well. Uh, we had a case here, I think two months ago, a, a major corporation uh, came to this board. Um, they had a, a very traditional looking array of experts. Um, we turned them down because the site had streams and wetlands uh, that they were not encapsulating, that they were encroaching very significantly on. And uh, the site was very wet, like this one. All those reasons were stated. And uh, it's, uh, it's unfortunate when we have to make that kind of call, uh, but it's our duty to be honest about the characteristics of, the, of each case that we review. Now, I can understand and I, and respect your responsibility to the public and, and then making responsible decisions. But approving a project w like this with all of the efforts we're going to to resolve all of your issues is not an irresponsible decision that's going to adversely affect the public in any way. It's only going to be help the public from a revenue standpoint and also an improvement of the property. So there's, there's just nothing irresponsible about a, approval of this project. And in, and in the last couple of years, you have approved 16 projects. There's only one project that you have denied, which is the Thornton. But it, it, the comments were made and the comments that I follow, that these are the comments from that, um, from that um, uh, 2016, which was last year, right at the time when I applied for my permit. And it says the reason this committee is approving this, because the Army Corps has signed up and TDAC has requested mitigation. That's exactly what I am doing. So in all fairness, you have done it and you have made a comment. These are the comments that you guys made. It is recorded in your, in your, in your uh, minutes. And it says right there, that is the only reason why you are approving it. So what is the difference about my approach? And, 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 and you know. The, so only, um, the only thing I can tell you too is we vote on a planner record and our planner record shows major encroachments. Um, and so right now, 
this plan of record showing this, uh, in, in my opinion, is unapprovable for the zone one buffer, putting a, a building over the zone one buffer here. Now, I hear that we, we've gone through TDEC and that, and I applaud you for that, but that's not reflected on the plan of record in front of me today. What I see today it still shows this, so when this gets looked up in the future time, you know, this is the plan of record. What I might encourage you to do is continue to work with staff to where before you bring this back, a well, plan similar to this back, either you don't have zone one buffer, you know, what, that you're invading here, or that you focus on the high area of your site. So right now, this plan of record is what we have to vote on, what the, what the committee votes on is this plan of record. And this plan of record shows a building deep into a zone one buffer. And I can't approve that uh, from, from, from my view of the regulations, uh, in, in my opinion. So this plan of record, to me, I can't. But you know, I would encourage you maybe work with staff to see if you know, maybe that is not truly a zone one buffer and, and then that would be a different scenario for me personally. I understand what you're, what you're saying about that it seems that there's a, we're treating you differently. I, I, and I have the same concerns, but what I've heard from both staff and um, Mr. Galbraith's comments are that the location and the type of stream and wetland here are different from the ones that you referred to earlier. Um, Scientifically, I don't have that background to know whether or not that should make a difference or not, personally, to be honest with you. Uh, but I do think that they see that that wetland has a, is different from the ones that you're talking about. Certainly, I can see how it's different from man-made wetlands, which is what you have over in the um, metro, whatever it's called, area. Um, but, uh, but I understand your concern. Uh, but, I, but I think they, they do believe there's a distinction between those two types of wetlands. Can, uh, can I request that uh, you defer this one for next meeting, next month meeting, uh, before making any decision on this one? Um, let us work with the staff. I don't think allowed to ask for that. I'd help. also give us there. 10 comments from Mill Creek. We would have time to, but we haven't had any time to discuss with them. We've addressed them, but we haven't had any chance to interact with them. So that, to allow that discussion, they may not object uh, once they can see all that's been done. A member of the committee would have to make the motion to defer. I don't see what problem. I'll make the motion to defer. Thank you. I'll, I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second to defer. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'll say in favor too for deferral. All opposed? I have to vote against it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman? Can yes. you clarify what you would want us as staff to work with the applicant? Um, so the stream, let's see, on the east side, on this side, uh, and the wetlands there, if we could work, uh, follow up with the core and, and TDEC and see if it is truly a, a wetland, see if it needs to be shown as a zone one, zone two buffer disturbance, uh, uh, or you could just confirm with them that it is a zone one, zone two. Does that make sense, or you, I'm getting some weird looks from you? I, I, I think I could encourage the applicant to follow our previous advice and my current statement, that is, if the site could be developed more vertically to avoid the wetland and the stream, it would help a lot. Just went with that. I see a lot of the heads nodding in the back, so that'd be preferable. Mr. Dale says. That, that's, our, that's our primary issue, is the wet portion of the site. The, I appreciate your comment. Uh, I think, I think the, the site is divided. And, and, and in order to access the site, you have to have a crossing. Crossing yes. of some kind. And, but and, and then once, once you permanent. put the crossing, it, this wetland is gone. There, there I, will be no wetland. There's but no I, way to preserve the wetland. But I, but I will caution you uh, to consider the Thornton case. Um, they encroached too much on wetlands and streams in that particular case, and we did not support it. So. Okay. Thank you, guys. I appreciate your time and effort on this. Thanks for the e yes. thank you for the extra time you've given us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
I guess I would like to see a, maybe a five minute break uh, from the board, we'll convene in five minutes, reconvene in five minutes. We want the next case. Penny. This is case number two zero one seven zero 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 one seven Fair Park at the Tennessee State Fairgrounds. The address is six twenty five Smith Avenue, APN one zero five one one zero three zero one. Zero, zero, zero. The applicant's request. The request is to is a following. One, disturbance and encroachment of the floodway and 75 feet floodway buffer, 50 feet in zone one and 25 feet in zone two of the Browns Creek for construction of sports, fields, parking and gates. Greenway Trails, Trailhead, and Pedestrian Bridge, Pavilion, Rain Gardens, Forestation, and Wet Metal areas, along with benches, picnic tables, bike rock, excuse me, bike racks, water foundations, lightning, and installation of fencing. The 100-year base flood elevation ranges from approximately 444.9 feet to 463 across the site. Excavation cut volume below two year elevation to be included in the compensation storage capacity, capacity calculations. Number three, placement of storm water B MP in the buffer. Number four, continuous mowing and maintenance of the, of the buffer. The appellate is Fairgrounds Nashville. Representative is Larry Edmond, and the comments are as follows. Stormwater staff comments. Staff and applicant met various times regarding proposed site improvements associated with this project. This proposed project represents a significant overall water quality improvement to the current site condition. Number two, staff requires the proposed project area on grass, temporary parking location, and anticipated use frequently be denoted in the site's stormwater management plan. And number three, project area being converted to grass from pavement or gravel should be monitored as part of the site's ongoing stormwater management plan to ensure all such grass areas remain vi viable over time. Codes, no comments were provided. Planning deferred. And Greenway comments, Greenway supports this project. It provides several elements supported in the 2017 plan to play parts and Greenway master plan update, including recreational opportunities, open space, and trails. Thank you, Penny. At this time, we'll turn it over to the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having us. In light of the hour, we're gonna do our very best to be very quick. Uh, and if I may, I thought we would give you a couple of introductions, a very short overview of how we got here today and who all is involved in this project. Uh, some brief comments from Councilman Sledge, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be very quick through the presentation, if that's acceptable. Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah, briefness is good at this point. Uh, okay, <laughs> got it. Um, let me start at the end of the table. Laura Schlesher is the new executive director of the Fairgrounds Nashville. Um, she has been on the job uh, eight months, nine months, 
And uh, so we have worked together a lot with that and the fair board. Next to her is Jonathan Snyder, one of our project managers. Matt Ellenberger, who is with Barge Cothran Engineering. Kim Hawkins and Nathan um, Oliver, excuse me, I went blank, I know that, um, with, with Hawkins Partners and Councilman Sledge. Briefly, uh, more than a year ago, we were, uh, and I'm Larry Adam, I, I represent Metro for large capital projects, uh, have for a number of years of varying sizes uh, and shapes. Um, so while we're a private firm, we do a lot related to large capital projects in Metro. The, um, the, about 18 months ago, I was asked, what could we do and how could we rethink the fairgrounds? Uh, and in that period of time, we have done a lot of thinking and a lot of studying, uh, some of which keeps getting modified. The one thing that has been very consistent is to take the land that is about 47 acres in and around Browns Creek and make it a public park. <laughs> As you may well remember, uh, everybody has a fairground story we've, we've learned. Um, there was ex there's an extraordinarily amount of large pavement on, on this site today. Uh, it involves the pit area for the racetrack. Uh, it uh, has had up to 600 buses parked, 300 of which were out of service. Maybe the hardest thing I've ever done in Metro was get those buses moved um, with the schools, which, you know, like everything, they were entrenched in, in parking in zones uh, one and two for years and years. Those buses are gone today. Um, so we, we set out to do a number of things using a number of consultants to figure out what to do, how to reimagine the fairgrounds. As you all know, the whole subject of soccer has now entered the conversation, but the consistent part of this is what do we do with the 47 acres in and around Browns Creek? We have done a lot of planning. Uh, we think we have a, a good idea, and that's what we'd like to, your consideration of today. Uh, because of some time commitments, Coley, would you like to go next? Yes, sure. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, I'm Colby Sledge. I'm the council member for District 17, uh, which sit, the fairground sits almost right in the middle of. Um, so I just wanted to give you, uh, from my sense, uh, and working with this team and working with Larry, uh, I'm extremely excited about the possibility here. Um, I think everything that Larry said I would echo, and I think he probably needs some sort of medal at some point for getting those buses off of the site, because those have, those things, if you look at every aerial shot of the fairgrounds, they're just white stripe after white stripe, and that's the top of those buses that have been sitting there. Um, the the potential here to to turn this into a public park is, is it cannot be overstated. Um, this is an area, if you look even just at this, this aerial uh, on the presentation um, that has typically been fairly industrial but has always had residential around it, um, including several well-established, long-time Nashville neighborhoods um, that don't have any space even close to what we're talking about here. Um, this site, as they will get into, um, if, if if approved today, would remove almost a mile worth of barbed wire fence on this property that has sat there. It would uh, put in a mile and a half of greenway, um, and it would provide a dog park uh, that is three times the size of the dog park down on the riverfront. And I can tell you, when I floated the idea of a dog park to my constituents, I could not get home before I got emails in support of it. Um, and so I think it addresses a lot of uses that people have been asking for you'll see the you'll see the proposal about multi-purpose fields and you'll see that sort of thing but obviously your charge is to make sure that it, it complies and that it will work well with our stormwater system and our waters throughout the county as you know Browns Creek is basically the most polluted watershed we have in the county. Um, I was informed during this process that it is essentially a no contact creek. I wish someone had told us that before we did several cleanups of Browns Creek, um, but I'm not glowing yet, so I think I'm okay. Um, the, the fact that we're moving vehicles off of this property and that we are restoring riparian buffers, that we have moved uh, the dog park to where we 
do, it doesn't sound like there will be an issue with the waste there with the uh, watershed. I think there is the actual possibility that this could be the first very, very, very small step in starting to see what we could do with the Browns Creek watershed to get it um, basically off the, I guess it's the 303 D list. I mean, it's, it's, it's gonna be a long, long time, but um, I think this is a very good and necessary step forward. Not to mention, obviously, what I've mentioned about constituents wanting it, but I think today what you'll see from a stormwater standpoint, it has been very thoughtful, and in my meeting with the team and with uh, Metro Water and Stormwater, the term win, win, win was used. That's the first and only time I've heard that in my two years on the council, and so I would hope that we could continue that today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. I appreciate that. All right. I'm going to take you all through um, a couple of images because, um, first of all, the history of the fairgrounds is so strong uh, in Nashville. So as we kind of look back, this is a shot from the 1930s, but basically for 125 years, this site has served our city in some capacity, originally in 1891 as Cumberland Park. And so this opportunity to return it back to a park. One of the things that's interesting in that first, um, that first image was that you couldn't find Browns Creek in the 1930s. Um, it had been the site of um, a horse track, harness racing, and then in the early 1900s became the first uh, racetrack actually for vehicles. Um, li the livestock arena, the ho additional horse track stables, all of those things were down along uh, the creek. And here you can kind of make it out um, just because we have a blue line in there that helps you see it. Uh, over the years, in the 1960s, kind of, you, you see the remnants of that. So you can still see the remnants of many of those pavement areas and paved areas that have existed there, again, for almost 125 years. Again, starting to see Browns Creek with a little bit of an edge, you still see the livestock arena right there. Um, and then as we move forward, um, and oh yeah, and the roller coaster and the Cascade Plunge is still there, so um, thank you. Uh, so again, part of Nashville's memory. And then as we move forward to the present day, that entire area, uh, you see the buses in this picture that, um, that Councilman Sledge just mentioned, and all of the other areas that you see there, many that you would go by and think are grass. They are not grass. It is um, heavily compacted gravel with grass and weeds that are growing on top, and there were, and, and we'll kind of take you through that. So it's just been, I would say, just an amazing process for us to be uh, privileged to work on this. Uh, Browns Creek is in the in the middle of the 440 Greenway, and a big part of the plan to play. Uh, process and just a few of the things, the, the 46 acres of the 30, 379 that are planned and planned to play, and it's right in the middle, this is really important, and a level of service gap. So it serves a really important community need that the councilman mentioned. Um, also 1.3 uh, miles of new multi-use trails, again, in the midst of an area with a level of service gap. Um, eight multi-purpose fields of 46 that are recommended in plan to play. And we've really concentrated on the area within the floodway and the buffers. So we do have 46, 47 acres, 31 of which is within the floodway and those two buffers. Um, and as you heard, it is a um, no contact creek. Um, it is on the 303D list for nitrates nitrites, phosphorus, habitat alteration, E. coli, and oil and grease. Um, it's, it's no contact, but unfortunately, the top left, the blue heron, and there's three beaver heads in there that Metro Water took a picture of last week when they were inside. They didn't, they didn't get the no contact info. But we're really glad to see them there. Uh, the creek has been primarily channelized over the years, and so um, th we're dealing with the ramifications of that as we go along. Um, and I, I mentioned the materials. I just want you to know the level of detail that we've gone through to really inspect these materials. We have called out pervious areas, areas that we call um, semi-pervious, and that's because there are old slabs of concrete, years and years of degraded um, asphalt, lots of compacted gravel, and again, the areas where you see green is, is really lawn over a lot of gravel and very little uncompacted lawn area. I think only about 8% of our site is, um, is not compact, compacted. 
Uh, one of the things that I really think is one of the most important is um, this image, which is not part of the documents that you received because it's uh, not part of a construction document, but part of the removal we have right now um, that shows the red shows all the areas that are currently impervious surface area to be removed. That's over seven acres of impervious area to be removed. That also includes the election commission building, which actually sits in the floodway and um, certainly doesn't meet any current requirements. Um, and that also includes the removal of one of the bridges. There are five bridges that are existing there now uh, crossing the, the Browns Creek. Two of those bridges will continue to serve the vehicular needs of the fairgrounds, and two of them are being repurposed to serve greenways. And then one additional bridge is being added right there next to Nolansville Road to provide um, the greenway loop. So it is at a much higher elevation. But overall, um, removing seven acres of pervious area, and then we're removing and remediating over 19 acres um, that will be remediated with a riparian area, meadow, and um, decompacted lawn to serve the purposes of multi-use fields. Um, we're also removing almost one mile uh, it's over 5,000 linear feet of fencing that actually goes right on both sides of the creek right now, um, which I think is also uh, just really important. We've met with Metro Stormwater, well, Metro Water Services and Stormwater six times during the process. We walk the site with them at one of those uh, one of those meetings and have actually incorporated many many of the recommendations where they said, "Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that?" Since we have this opportunity, so we've incorporated those. This has been presented to and approved by the Parks Board, by the Fair Board, uh, by the Greenways Commission and uh, Greenways for Nashville. And um, I can't tell you how delighted we are to be here. And with that, I'm going to really let Matt is going to go through any details, but we might just open it for your questions. And you have a lot of detailed information in front of you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. <clears throat> and support is going right in, into discussion. Because, Dodd, go ahead, please. Okay, uh, really appreciate um, the team that's assembled here. Um, I know you all have worked on other projects for the city that have turned around some pretty uh, signif significantly impacted sites like the, the new amphitheater site, which was a super fun site. And so we, we, we appreciate the experience you bring to this. Um, secondly, uh, just a question, I, I, I don't have any questions or concerns about everything's been proposed I guess I'm thinking of, of another opportunity did you all talk about in the field uh, and by the way did, did you get mr. hunt out in the field so he could I want him to have more fun than he, get, he gets to have in this hearing so anyway but we need a little bit of levity today folks so, <laughs> so thank you for laughing so uh, uh, when you had the folks out in the field did anybody think about uh, removing some of those vertical uh, embankments and pulling those embankments back to a, like a three to one slope and revegetating. I'll those. tell you, there are a lot of things that we looked at. Um, the the main thing, because it's a no contact creek, one of the things that we did not want to do is actually invite people down to the creek. Um, so the one area that we did look at that for was where it was there, it was concrete, not the old stone. Uh, but the reason we did not do that is because of the no contact. We okay. it was considered. Um, I, there are a couple of other areas that I just want you to be aware of along the creek where per metro water, metro storm water, there are a couple of places where we are kind of busting through that edge that's been built up over time, so that we're allowing several areas for inundation to occur that okay. do not occur right now because it is so channelized. So we are doing several things like that. Okay. It felt like we could do that without promoting contact. Is yep. there signage for the no contact? Uh, is there signage for the public so the public understands there's, there's it's a no contact creek? Uh, we will have, we have several signs that we're putting up on the restoration and riparian, mm -hmm. that, and we can include that information. We hope one day for it to come off of that. But, yeah. Um, I, I, but we'll change the signs when that happens. Exactly, exactly. I, I'd love to see that day myself. Yeah. Yeah. And and um, have you talked to any organizations like that do stream mitigation work that might provide additional resources to to help this we, be more successful? We had a meeting with um, Metro Stormwater, with Metro Parks and Greenways, and the mayor's office, and uh, actually did apply for a grant. I can't remember the name of it right now, um, but we did apply. We did not 
receive um, the funding for that, but we have gone through that process and did make grant application. I, I, I know just in my own experience when we've tried to reforest compacted soils just in farm fields, yep. we had to replant trees three times yep. over 10 years, yep. and we had really slow responses yep. from the trees that we did get in, so it, it, uh, it's a real challenge, but I appreciate you We're taking it on. We're very excited about it and are basically using um, mitigation techniques that are used in strip mining as a way to um, repopulate the forest and the, um, that riparian edge. Mm. So, Mr. Chairman, are we reviewing anything here other than just activity in the buffers to allow this project to take place? No structures, no well, that's what major I'm infrastructure changes other than just trying to maintenance. address maintenance. Okay. Yeah, maintenance and mowing of the buffers. Um, there's a pavilion. Uh, actually, I was trying to find that out. The pavilion, well, I, from what I think I've seen the plans, it's a uh, pavilion on, on uh, poles, so it's not... The knob. There's a, yeah, there is one pavilion right there. It's in the um, footprint area of the election commission building <coughs> that we are putting back in. It does not have walls. It just has columns with a okay. top on it. Um, there is a restroom area. It's out of the floodway and buffers, and there is another pavilion that's completely out of the floodway and buffers. So the only structure within it is that one pavilion. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Yes. Well, <coughs> Do you want to hear my fairground story? Is it brief? <laughs> Is it relevant? <laughs> so she said that, so I'm, I'm old enough to have swum, to have been swimming at the Cascades, so uh, I remember the razor blade uh, Nashville myth, you know, that someone put razor blades on the slide. So I don't know if you've heard that one, Cam. I have Cam. heard that one. That's a very popular Nashville legend. Uh, the Hook Man's probably number one Nashville legend. But uh, so anyway, uh, I'm pleased to see this. My office is right by it, uh, so I'm very familiar with uh, the fairgrounds, and I, I think this is an awesome project. But I do have one question about, uh, I know that uh, you know the fairgrounds is gonna maintain operation, and I think they have a tunnel there right now that provides access or emergency access. How, how do y'all deal with that, or what kind of provisions have you made for? Are you talking about the tunnel to the speedway? Mm -hmm. So um, the, it's on that low side. I think mm -hmm. it's on the Browns Creek yep. side. The, so the bridge, the bridge that accesses the speedway right now will become a greenway bridge, and it will no longer serve as an access to the speedway. So uh, part of this is the removal where the pit is, that entire area, again, uh, goes away as pavement, and that would have to be relocated outside of the floodway and those buffers. So that tunnel would no longer be used for, um, for So speedway they would put access. another tunnel in or another? Uh, There's a plan to put another access okay. for the speedway around on the north side. So that would be done at the same time as this project, uh, I assume? Is that? Presumably, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. We, we've got a lot of moving I'm parts. I'm just familiar with the area down there, we're, so. We're, yeah. We've got a lot of moving parts right. of all the elements of the fairgrounds right now. Sure. But that is in, in the plan. And, and the fair, the, ra the racetrack right now is the subject of an RFQ that has had four respondents that's under consideration right now. Sure. For, for future ideas of what, what to do with that facility. Um, so that's, that's up in the air, but we can't, Laura nor I can talk about it because we're on the on the selection committee. Well, this is just a curiosity. I mean, it has really not, not much to do with what you're asking today, and I appreciate your proposal, and you've got a very great team put together, and I'm excited about uh, this project and what it will bring to this area, which where my office is, so. Uh, I wanted to ask, is there anyone from the community to speak for or against? Open the floor up to the community. Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, no, I'm, I'm very excited by by this proposal. I think it's going to be a, a huge benefit to the area. Uh, I would like to see signs that uh, educate the public because, uh, you know, I would be in that creek if, it, if I'm there. And I would say we will have signs. That we do have them already on the riparian areas. And we will also have some. We've had a lot of work with uh, Metro Stormwater on the dog park, which is not what we're considering mm -hmm. today because that's inside the buffers. But we will have additional signage on that as well. Wonderful. Because that's a big issue. And there's a, is there a mowing and maintenance plan? There is. Okay. Let, let, let Laura address yeah. that, because there's a joint effort between the Parks Department and the Fair Board, and that has been, been being memorialized in an MOU that Laura okay. worked on yesterday. Wonderful. 
Hi, thank, thank you, you for having us. Yeah, we're really excited about this project. It was a fantastic opportunity coming in almost a year ago, um, moving here and, and undertaking this project has been fantastic. And you're right, we have a great team put together. Uh, we are working actively with the parks, Metro Parks currently to define that MOU uh, as far as maintenance. Even though that the property remains fairgrounds property, we will be working really closely on day-to-day -day maintenance and scheduling of the community park with Metro Parks. Wonderful, wonderful. You might be interested to know that Laura came from the Milwaukee Parks Department. Wonderful. We're coming here, so Good she gets parks. Great. Good to have you here. So uh, on the maintenance side, I know you all uh, had an arboretum down at the Riverfront Amphitheater Park. Do you envision having that level of quality uh, management in any time in the future? The, the number of trees that were, the quality of our trees along that edge, um, we don't have as broad of a range. Uh, and we're doing some reforestation. Most of that is being done with whips and saplings. Um, so we are repopulating it, but as far as an arboretum and the 35 species, we probably would not, I don't foresee us reaching the 35 species. Uh, we are dealing with lots of natives and uh, the grasslands, we've gotten information from grasslands are including some of that and wildflowers, but as far as the 35 species of trees, I, I don't see being able to reach that um, diversity in, right at this point. So for, for the benefit of the members of the committee, I'm seeing 10 acres of restored riparian vegetation, seven, 75, seven, 75 tenths of an acre uh, of reforestation and 1.8 acres of rain gardens. Um, so it, it, it sounds like, would the staff, would this be sufficient mitigation in your mind for the maintenance that they're proposing? Yeah, I think so. Historically, we have been involved several times with this site over the years as far as looking at what might be done to enhance this area given the present and ongoing use. Uh, we in the past had approached Tennessee Stream Mitigation Program to look at options. That all fell through over time. So I think we were very excited and I just want to publicly thank the group for their work working with us. I know at times staff has uh, been a little bit persistent given the characteristics of this creek and they've continued to work with us and, and we do feel like that this is a significant improvement for this particular segment. We're going to keep sampling it with hopefully getting better results. We were out there this week getting some of the catch basins labeled with some interns and saw the herons and the beavers and whatnot. So um, we're continuing to investigate and hope it sometime soon we'll be able to submit data to TDEC. Mr. Chairman, I'm, all, I'm ready to make a motion. That's okay. Please. All right. Um, I'm going to make a comment that is unrelated to the motion, but I just want to encourage you all to dream big for this site. I realize there's lots of limitations, but uh, I know you all are capable of doing that if, you, if you're given the flexibility. So I'm going to move for approval as presented and ask for a second. Second. All right. We have an approval and a second. Any further discussion? I will echo Mr. Galbraith's uh, uh, um, note about let's see what we can do. I think the stream banks and the stream uh, maybe in the future could be done a lot more mitigation, a lot more, mitigation, a lot more restoration to the stream through here. And so just be open to that in the future. It's not a requirement. It's just a, a friendly suggestion. Any more comments? Call for the question. All right. We have a motion in to approve and a second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, it's approved. Thank you guys. I appreciate your time Thank and effort on this. Thank you very much for your time. Time though. It was when the uh, conductor Skimmerhorn moved out from Milwaukee. He followed me down and then. 
It's a great city to visit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, didn't even, yeah, you didn't even realize you were throwing that in there, did you? Yeah. All summer long, festival after festival. All right, so we have one. Yeah, exactly. Winter starts, then they drink here inside. All right, we'll move on to the next case so we can move through. Is the applicant for uh, the Como uh, Polo Campero? Yeah. All right. I'm trying to find a site plan here. Gotcha. you didn't need it. Um, this will hopefully be the most mundane thing we do this morning. Um, we are here, this site is located very near the intersection of Harding Place and Nolensville Road. I'm sorry, should I have waited? I'm just excited. <laughs> Officially we need to read it into the yeah, record. I'll uh, so uh, I see the excitement, but. Yeah, it's very exciting. <laughs> Penny, please read us in. Okay, this is case number. Two zero one seven zero 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 one eight, and this is at the location of thirty Hardy Mile Drive, Palo Campero. And the applicant's request is as following: disturbance of the floodway and seventy-five floodway buffer, fifty feet zone one and twenty-five feet in zone two of Seven Mile Creek with proposed ADA accessible ramp to existing patio. Driveway, excuse me, drive through window addition requiring subgrade grease in, interpreter and rain garden, Allen, rain garden Allens as part of the proposed mitigation plan to offset previous area disturbed, disturbed by ADA ramp and provide additional green space. The 100-year base flood elevation is 499.0. A built number two is ability to mow, maintain grass and landscape area within the buffer, exit island areas, and behind curb at north and west parking stalls, and slope grass areas between stalls and patio. The appellant is Stone and Hard Hardworth, Representative Mr. Tripp Smith. And the comments are as following. Stormwater staff. Staff supports the variance based on the site circumstances. Codes, no comments were provided. Planning, defer. Site is zoned SCR, defer to stormwater for review and Greenway refers to stormwater staff for comments. All right, thank you, Penny. At this time, we'll turn over to the applicant. Yay. So Mr. Smith isn't here, which is a good thing for everybody because he talks a lot more than I do, if you can believe that. So again, this, um, this Pollo Campero, this concept is, this building is currently, was a chili burrito. Um, the intersection of Harding Place and Nolensville Road is just to the west. Um, the big Walmart on Nolensville Road is up here to the northwest. You can, there's actually a bridge right here that connects that parking lot behind Walmart um, that connects to our site. It's hard to see for me. Maybe I'll have a better view. Um, this is all floodway right here, and the zone one kind of caps this corner of the existing building and goes right here, and zone two is right there-ish. Um, so what we are doing right now is there is a walkway around the, exist, the old chili burrito, and then it uh, slopes some grading. This is really the only green space right in here where our, our, potential, our proposed handicap uh, ADA accessible ramp is. Um, is right there, and um, we are proposing because the concept of my clients calls for a drive-through. So in order to accommodate the drive-through, we needed to move it right here 
because of the grade changes and to stay out of the floodway. Um, and that meant we needed to relocate ADA. So we are, the green space that exists right now is now being taken up by an ADA ramp. Um, we have added a booth for a drive-through right here, which is, uh, for the most part, out of zone one, maybe a touch in. Um, we have relocated the grease interceptor out of zone one, um, and we have added uh, some freezer storage right here to the east of the building. Um, we worked with uh, stormwater on this, on, on you know getting because we were losing some green space in the floodway. So we have added a parking, an island here in the middle of the parking lot, um, the, to what I believe the term was a. Uh, with uh, respect to the great Kimberly Hayes, a Kimberly Rain Garden um, at their request. Um, <laughs> I figured I'd get one laugh out of that. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a Kimberly Rain Garden right here. Um, <laughs> if it we went any deeper, it, we were going to have to do handrails around it <clears throat> for safety. So we kept it as shallow as we could while still achieving the design criteria necessary for a rain garden. Um, and so what we are seeking right now is the ability to put this ADA ramp in the floodway um, as well as uh, some of this disturbance right here, or the Kimberly, I'm going to stop saying that, the rain garden partially in zone one and then in zone two. And then maintenance for the green space that remains. Do we have an aerial image? Yeah, that will help. I'll, I'll tell you my slot simpler. And just for the record, this is an existing building. Do you know about, yes, about what year it was built? I do not know awesome. what year it was built. Um, I presume the chili burrito concept seemingly took off in the uh, early 2000s, so I would at least guess then. Okay. But I, I don't know exactly when. So within, uh, you have a pointer, don't you? Yes, sir. Can you show me, you said something about a green area that's being lost. Can you show where that would be? Right, about right there. Exactly. So mowed, mowed grass. Yeah, yeah. mowed, yeah. maintained. Perfect. Thank you. And, and what does the ramp do? What does it connect it, the ADA? The ramp will connect the parking lot area right here. Our, our uh, ADA parking spot will be, and, and the loading area will be right here. And the ADA ramp will connect, it'll go back and forth and connect to the so front door, which will be right the there. Lot to the, yes, sir. To the business, okay. And, uh, and your island is, is where again? You're right, right about there. New island. So, so you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna cut the concrete? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going to make it. In an effort to offset perfect. the loss of green space right here. Okay. And where's the, the driveway? The drive-through, drive we're not touching the building, so the drive-through will loop in, let's see if I can do this with a steady hand, can I come this way, down, back, and then go back around. We're proposing to leave that little green space right there, the green circle. So your drive-through will be on the passenger side? No, it'll be on the driver's side. Oh, driver's side. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. You just, I hadn't even really thought about that. You kind of shot me for a second. No, it'll be on the driver's side. <laughs> and I was like, holy crap, that's a bad design. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just flipped over here. It's been a long morning. Yeah. <laughs> the little square you're adding in, is it, is it a structural component into the zone one buffer? The or structure that we're at. Oh, no, it's just a, a window thing. Um, because right now, this is all lobby. And so we're going to repurpose where it is with the kitchen. And so just sticking out a little bit. Because we had needed room for the grease interceptor one. Yeah. So we wanted to push this out away from, and just to make this so it wasn't such a harsh curve, wasn't really good turning radiuses in here. So we pushed the drive through window out a little bit to make that an easier turn to make okay. and give, some, give us some more space for them to queue up. Cars to Q. Are you Trip? No, I'm not. I'm I'm Chip. You're Chip. It's fine. All right, Chip. So did you did you track this through the whole process yourself? Yeah, Trip and I worked together. Uh huh. The other did, um, so how, what did you think about that process? Through this process? Mm -hmm. it yeah. Was, how, it was it was interesting. I mean, how difficult do you think that was? Your your own television. Sure it was it wasn't wasn't the first time we had done it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I hate to, to know that Paula is moving to a somewhere else. She's extremely helpful in this process. Yeah. Um, but you know, the man here, just getting. Well, I was just curious. Now. I mean, uh, I, you know, for something <laughs> this simple, yeah, to have to go through that mm -hmm. a level of detail seems extreme to me. 
I don't know if there's any way a process could be streamlined on something like this that is this simple. But I mean, we've got flood profiles. We, we've got all kinds of information. I, I, I applaud the applicant for going mm -hmm. through it. And I, I agree that this is a developed site and these are minor revisions to an yeah. existing site. Exactly. Which uh, um, maybe at some point we could look at ways to. Well, I mean, the, the staff is actually on. making a recommendation. They're, they're, and I don't think on a lot of the. Uh, comments we get from staff, they're sort of just, here's the facts, yeah. and you make a decision. But in situations where it's fairly clear, I think that the staff should have some flexibility to come to us with a recommendation on something simple like this without an applicant having to go through so much detail. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we respected the policy behind why yeah. we had to do it and understood that. Well, um, you seem very tolerant, patient, and, but I, I just wanted to ask the question because yeah. I did look at the at the at the at all the data that you had to put uh, assemble here. I so. was I was a bit surprised that there was not some form of consent agenda mm -hmm. available to applicants to right. this committee. Well, anyway, I, pr I appreciate your patience. Well, I'm going to help the process by making a motion we approve Please. as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. I'll call for a vote. All approved. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. I appreciate your time and your effort on this. Thank you. All right, guys. We need to move into the business section of our meeting. Oh. Um, we already did that. I went back and did it. Thank you for reminding yeah. me. Um, the main thing that I know that we need to do is uh, elect a new chairman. And so I've never really been through this process too much. We did a, a, a ballot. I guess, I guess we did it when we did a ballot before. We don't really have a real ironed out process. No, so I'll, you don't do ballots. You, you do nominations and then you... Um, so yeah. did you announce that you were not going to be here anymore? Yeah, we did last time. Oh, okay. Where were you? I don't know. <laughs> I, I must it was have. It was announced. Yeah, I had to leave early that day. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Well, I hate to see you go. I appreciate that. And and for the record, I've, I, I, this has been one of the highlights of my really professional career is being on this board. So I, I greatly appreciate everyone's input and uh, guidance for me. And so I, I will miss you guys and Paula. Where Paula's at. <laughs> Um, so I, I do thank you for allowing me to serve on the board and, and, and all the input and the, and the good work we've done. So I appreciate you guys. With that being said, I'll open the floor up for nominations. Isn't the vice president, vice chair, just the gun chair? The floor. The floor is open for nominations. I second. And Slade, is it your time to accept or? He's thinking. He's very pensive over yeah, there. Yeah, opposite. I don't know that I did that. Do it doesn't matter. But it doesn't matter? Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm not willing to serve. No, yeah, I am willing to do it. I'll stand. I'm not going to deny the opportunity to request that I don't leave. So that's so kind of comment on this? It is. It is. Is the floor of the discussion? Yeah, sure. All right. Well, I think Slade would do an excellent job, um, you know, based upon his uh, legal standing and his understanding of how to parliamentary probably uh, handle a process. Uh, um, I think you'd be very forceful to stop discussions that probably go, uh, are too lengthy and <laughs> debates that probably occur. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wholeheartedly uh, support his nomination. I appreciate that, and I, I will second those comments. I think Slater will make an excellent uh, chair for this committee. I'll, I'll move we uh, elect him by uh, acclamation, and all nominations cease. I'll second that if that's the proper motion. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, Mr. Slade, you are officially chairman. Do I take over now, or is it next to me? No. Nah. Do you want to elect the vice chair? Yeah, I think you question. Yeah, I was going to say, I think I get one more thing to do, elect here as a vice chair. Uh, so I'm opening up the floor for nomination for vice chair. I think I, I would um, nominate Dot to vice chair for the vice chair. I'll second that motion. Are you willing to serve, sir? I'm willing to serve with Mr. Slade if he stays the chair. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Agreed. Agreed and awesome. second that. 
That makes me his campaign partner, I think. I? <laughs> we, we, so. we can go on the road now. <laughs> I'll babysit for you too. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty tall order for him. He may take you up on that one. You know? I didn't say how many times. Yes. All right, so we have a nomination and a second for vice. Uh, call for vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, guys, we have a new vice and a new chair. Thank you, guys. And I'll turn the meeting over. Just real quick, in appreciation for your service, Lance, thank you. Um, we have a generous certificate for you to display, I'm sure, with, with honor. And uh, was signed by the director, and on behalf of the Water Department, we thank you for your service. Thank you, sir, very uh, much. And one other thing, our new appointee is present, Carrie Stokes. I'll invite her to come up, and I hope you'll welcome her and let her tell you a little bit about herself. Sure. Well, hello. I'm Carrie Stokes, and I'm met some of you, but not all of you, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to serve. And so just a little bit about me. Um, I came to Nashville to go to Vanderbilt. I have an undergrad and a master's degree from there in civil and environmental engineering. And as an intern, or um, some of you my junior and senior year started as an intern at Ford Runner Center in Canada and have been there my career. Um, I currently serve as the director of our environment and water resources group. So kind of have a varied background in environmental compliance, um, investigation, and remedial design, and then certainly water resources, stormwater from a standpoint of dealing with development clients, municipalities, uh, federal entities, TVA, and TDOT, and others. And so I'm happy to answer any questions <laughs> about me, but certainly just looking forward to the opportunity to work with you. Welcome. I've got a legal question. So it, along that vein, uh, should we direct those recommendations on the record or, or can we direct them off the record? So you guys cannot talk about substantive issues amongst yourselves outside of the context of a properly noticed open meeting. However, you can talk to staff, any of you individually can talk to staff directly and you can talk to me directly anytime you want to. So. And then staff, I think, would then take responsibility for putting any, you know, proposed changes on the agenda for the committee to consider as a whole. Committee, we are. Did she forward that to you to say, I'd like some, I mean, I, had to, I wrote my own language, <laughs> uh, you know, which I, I think probably meets what we ought to do, but I wouldn't mind having yeah. the standard. So th there is an AG opinion about um, members of boards and commissions having ex parte contact with members of the public who may come before them. Um, and you're correct. Basically, the, this type of board or commission um, sits in kind of a quasi-judicial or administrative um, uh, kind of form of review um, and so because of that you're a little bit more more like a judge and so the ex parte contact is inappropriate um, whereas you know a committee that um, kind of creates legislation like council um, uh, the ex parte contact happens all the time and it's kind of the constituent feedback that they need to develop the legislation that they're charged with developing so they're, they're very different types of bodies basically and and but this is the type where you should be con you're correct to be concerned about that but I'd be 
glad to recirculate that um, AG yeah, opinion. If you could forward that email. Okay, because I, I sent it to mm -hmm. Steve to let him look at it, but I can I just, yeah, and, and if you could just let us send it out to sure. the group so that, because I went ahead and put together two sentence, just blurb that says, this is why I can't talk. Please right, that right. But if you could check that, rewrite it, whatever, and send it out to the group, that way we can have it just cut it and paste it to our responses. Because, yeah. I mean, she went online and found my email. I mean, she, she probably did what she's exactly what she thought. Yeah, she I mean, there, yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is very common for people to do that. All of, all of the, I think there was an ordinance saying that all council members, or excuse me, all committee and commission and board members' emails had to be, you know, publicly available. And so, I, I mean, there is that issue, but um, you, and it sounds like you responded very appropriately. Yeah. So, so uh, along the lines of this type of conversation, um, uh, I would love to see us schedule a session to talk about administrative procedure, consent, calendar opportunities, ways to empower staff to handle more routine things like happens at, in the state and federal level, and, uh, and of course have the proper uh, legal and regulatory guidance as to what we're allowed to, to change. But, uh, but secondly, uh, uh, um, and this is intended as a closing comment for me, um, we, we need uh, formal written staff feedback on individual cases in the record. And um, uh, particularly since um, uh, we have a different type of, of uh, preparation for this for this process now uh, with with new people and and new experiences and, and there's going to be an adjustment period, we need staff uh, to to really step in and, and 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 not just do what they've done in the past, but give as much as they can. Uh, uh, and several of us were kind of commenting on that that we felt a little under informed today, and that's why we asked explicitly for it. And uh, and it will go a lot faster. I think if it's formalized in the record, it'll it'll get better public review, and it'll make our job a lot easier and, and help things move along a lot faster. Understood. Okay. We'll get that done. sessions y'all feel like we need to do, and then talk about what staff uh, function and uh, responsibilities are so, relative to the dynamic of the group. So just in terms of the, like the some of the issues that we talked about, we've talked about um, uh, you know, op the Open Meetings Act and um, uh, uh, Robert's Rules of Order and that, that AG opinion on the ex parte contact issue um, and um, uh, maybe a few other questions like, like what is a hardship? Um, you know, we've done kind of like a, a legal to the committee um, orientation in past years um, a couple of times. Maybe we don't do it often enough. Um, but I'd be glad to do that again if you want to just put something on the heel of one of the agendas or something like that. Well, or that or a separate, whatever. The or a separate meeting, yeah, to, sure, whatever. In your experience, I, how I, long was the session that you hosted? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the kind of thing that we could do outside of the public meeting context, context but I would encourage you to do it in the public meeting context. Um, I, I, I don't think there would be any harm in members of the public who are interested, and there probably won't be any remaining at the, at the end of a committee meeting to um, to listen in. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, when um, communication is kind of one-sided, it's, you know, informational from me to the committee, then that doesn't necessarily come in under open meetings. But um, to the extent we can keep things in the open meetings context as much as possible, that's highly encouraged. So. I would also add to that um, that session, basically your interactions, how the, the chair and vice chair and the secretary need to work together. Um, I know Paula used to do a whole lot and made my job, uh, my whole job, real easy. And as Penny comes on now, this would be a good time to define those roles better. Right. Who okay. takes charge in the meeting, who doesn't take charge in the meeting, who takes charge at which point. Um, I mean, that may not be such a legal question. I mean, Robert's rules may speak to some of that, um, and there are various different ways to do it, regardless, like with every, 
I mean, I staff multiple metro boards and commissions, yeah. and they all do things just a little bit differently from each other. Um, so you have a lot of different examples you could pick from. You know. it, it, exactly. I just think it needs to be discussed, because I, I noticed it today with Penny and I's first meeting, where we start and stop. There was, you know, it was nothing bad, but you know, that would be, be a good time to define that with new people on the board and, and, the, and the changeover. We'll make that an agenda item, too, and see what the new chair's preference is, and, yeah. and, and so agreed. Penny's asked that question, so it's not been lost on her. So we knew today was going to kind of be our first experience to kind of understand it, and we'll be, we'll be tweaking it. So I appreciate that feedback. Well, I think so, you did a great job. Yes, I think so. And so familiarity with, with some of the terminology, the, some of the terms that come before this group are not commonly used terms, so we'll be working on some of those. But I, I will ask, unless you want to decide today, we can send out a doodle poll. A doodle poll on when to have the sessions. If that's acceptable, you can go back and look at your own schedules. I'm trying to it. Okay. It's probably difficult for everybody as it is to make them more fun. Yeah. Meetings are getting long right now. Yeah. Maybe there's some time that opens up. Yeah. Certainly this isn't uh, something that has to happen next week. Yeah. Well, uh, so I, I, would, I would suggest, unless the board thinks otherwise, that we just kind of on a light day, so on a, on a, on a day where it looks like we're going to have two cases, maybe three. That's back next back month, two cases, right, Penny? So far, for Can August? That's the third. Is he yeah. coming back next month? Uh, that's going to okay. be three. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Right now we have we're we're going to try to maybe meet with him <laughs> with legal on the aloft. You were lucky that was your one of your last cases, Lance. So one for the record books, I guess. But but we may reach out to him and do as much as we can at the staff level and with some legal input. So he may not be back. I don't know. But but anyway. So next meeting probably sounds like a good one, and I would I would think we're going to add more than twenty thirty minutes. So we maybe we can only touch. One issue, one issue. I, mean, I don't think any of it will take that long, but I mean, as many questions you all have, I guess. But when I've done a little presentation before, I don't think it took more than 20 years. And I don't commit to watch it on TV because I can't be here for the next meeting, but that's okay. So you're not here either. I'll watch it on TV. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we may still do the doodle poll. We'll, we'll contemplate next meeting and then we'll get feedback to see because we do want everyone to be present if we can. So, okay. All right. I move to adjourn. I second. If I can, still do that. All in favor of adjournment? Aye. 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 Thank you guys. It's been great. Appreciate it. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.